Good evening, everybody. This is Dr. Bob with the Dr. Bob YouTube channel. I hope that everyone is doing well. Um, it is my pleasure to be back with you all after a nearly three-month hiatus of making videos. Um, my apologies to that, um, but for those who follow me closely or know me in real life, um, YouTube is merely a hobby of mine uh, that I hope will bless uh, each of you. Um, but with a busy job uh, in the medical field as an actual doctor and um, also uh, family considerations, um, I only have so much time in the day and uh, hope to uh, use that as well as I can. Um, but uh, tonight's video is going to be one that I've been preparing for for three months. As those of you who know me um, and who have followed my channel know, uh, three months ago uh, I did a debate with an Eastern Orthodox lay apologist and YouTuber by the name of Brother Augustine on the sacerdotal priesthood and whether the Christian faith teaches a sacerdotal priesthood. Um, if you want to go and check out that debate, it is on the Brother Augustine YouTube channel. Um, my point tonight is not to review the debate. I did that in my last video, but to go uh, into one of the primary uh, sources and references, as you can see on the screen, that I used in preparing for that debate. Um, it is a book that was written and published in 1979 by Bishop Richard Hansen called The Christian Priesthood Examined. Um, I think that this is an absolutely uh, vital issue that, uh, as I discussed uh, in my uh, debate review video, that is not talked about enough. Um, the doctrine of Christian ministry is one of the most important and yet least uh, understood, uh, least researched, and least uh, thought about in depth uh, doctrines of the Christian faith. And I believe it is actually absolutely vital in our day and age as the Christian ministry is under assault uh, to go back and to look at the origins of the various claimed Christian traditions, uh, uh, views of ministry, uh, whether we look at the imperial churches or high Protestant churches, or we look at uh, low church Protestantism. Uh, what is the reasons that we do uh, what we do when it comes to um, having um, an official ministry? Um, <laughs> jumping uh, uh, into it, uh, I just wanted to give a little bit of an introduction to who Richard Hansen is, uh, since he was just dismissed by uh, my opponent, which I think was uh, <laughs> very rude uh, and very uh, uh, inappropriately dismissive um, as uh, one of the things that, uh, if you dive deep enough into scholarly work on early church history, you'll see that the uh, earliest people in the modern period, going back to the 1800s, uh, maybe even the 1700s, to do work in patristics uh, from a scholarly perspective, it was pretty much all Protestants uh, who did uh, scholarship. Yes, you had a few Greeks here and there, as Schaff discusses in History of the Christian Church. You have uh, a good number of Roman Catholics who started getting into the game uh, in the 1800s, but a lot of the original research and original work and collating um, manuscripts from the early church period, uh, looking at the early church fathers, and looking at doctrine uh, as it was practiced in sort of the anti-Nicene period as well as in the Nicene and post-Nicene period of the early church, uh, up until the, the start of the medieval period um, with the collapse of the Western Empire and then 150 years later, the rise of Islam. Um, a lot of that original work was done by Protestants and Bishop Hansen is foremost uh, in sort of the mid-1900s, uh, so the middle of the last century from about 1950 into the 80s, I believe, uh, was when he was doing a lot of his scholarly work, about a 30 or 40 year career. Um, 
he did a ton. Um, as far as his biography, uh, Richard Hansen was the Bishop of Clower in the Church of Ireland, which is a province of the Anglican Communion. So he was an Anglican uh, from 1970 to 1973. Uh, he resigned his bishopric, oddly enough, to take up a faculty position in systematic theology at Manchester University. He previously held the J.B. Lightfoot, there's a name from church history, uh, Professor of Divinity at the University of Durham in the early 1960s. He was widely published during his life and was one of the most accomplished patristic scholars in the history of the English-speaking world. Um, the fact that he was dismissed by my opponent in the debate, well, we'll leave that for uh, what it was. Um, his uh, other book, uh, well, he wrote a number of books, but uh, his book, The Search for the Christian Doctrine of God, The Arian Controversy, is to this day considered the foremost scholarly work on the Council of Nicaea and the emergence of Nicene Orthodoxy. So uh, Bishop Hansen was not just a high bishop in the Church of England uh, or within the Anglican Communion, but uh, was also a very accomplished uh, scholar. I think this is one of the reasons that uh, James White actually quoted him and quoted the book that I am reviewing, uh, this book, uh, The Christian Priesthood Examined, um, in his debate with uh, Father Mitchell Pacwa um, on the uh, Christian priesthood, which is, to my knowledge, one of the only major, maybe there's been some other minor people, um, public debates uh, between a Protestant and an imperial church representative, um, Bishop Pacwa, or Father Pacwa being uh, of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, on the sacerdotal priesthood. Um, so I think that uh, this book is a vital resource in understanding the history of the development of the doctrine of the priesthood and uh, really sort of examining uh, all of our presuppositions, whether one be a Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox or an Anglican or a low church Protestant uh, of any stripe um, or somebody who is just curious about uh, Christian history. Uh, this is a book that I cannot recommend enough. Um, it is divided, uh, the book, so now we're getting into our discussion of the book, uh, Christian Priesthood Examined is divided into five chapters. Uh, chapter one is evidence in the New Testament. Chapter two is the emergence of the Christian priesthood. Chapter 3 is the development of episcopacy and priesthood. Chapter 4 is the meaning of Christian priesthood. And, uh, oops, yeah, there are only four chapters, uh, not five. So those are the four chapters, and there are 117 total pages in the main body of the manuscript. And he also cites his um, sources in the bibliography at the end. Um, so this is really a popular book, but it has a little bit of a scholarly bent, even for a popular book. Uh, I cannot recommend it enough. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go chapter by chapter. Um, I have a lot of quotes in here from him, as well as my thoughts as I was preparing for this video. Um, we're going to just take a look at his argument, uh, and then at the end we're going to and we're going to break down that argument uh, as we go. Um, I don't have a lot of page numbers. Uh, it's mainly uh, my notes are organized by chapter, but uh, the book is short. Um, it's an easy read, um, especially for somebody with a seminary level background. Uh, this will be a very easy read for you. And even for somebody with a lay background um, who's just interested in this topic, um, I think it will be something that uh, would be a uh, uh, a good read and something that you'll be able to understand uh, the vast majority of what he is talking about. Um, so, uh, starting with chapter one, Evidence in the New Testament, Hansen opens up by discussing the ambiguity of the term, quote, priest. Um, he then talks about uh, this term and what it means uh, when we say the word priest. Uh, and then he goes in and he starts uh, talking about um, the various Christian traditions and their understanding of the Christian ministry. He says that sacerdotal churches assert a priesthood that is ordained by Christ and his apostles from the beginning and that there's nothing to explain. This is just an assumption. If you walk into a Roman Catholic church or an Eastern Orthodox church or an Oriental Orthodox church, um, you, you know, or the 
tiny church of the east uh, that still exists. Um, there, this will just be taken as an assumption. You know, you have the priest who's up front. He's appointed by a bishop who sits over him, and there's you know some other level of bishop or archbishop or patriarch who's above him, and that uh, this is the way that it's always been. Uh, Non-sacerdotal churches, um, so your low churches, which would include Presbyterians, Baptists, Pentecostals, uh, not exactly Methodists because they still have bishops, but they call their local ministers pastors. Um, you know, your sort of low church Anglicans, um, your non-denom churches, um, they would deny this claim, uh, and I believe rightfully so. Asserting other forms of ministry, and this is where we'll get into Hansen's argument, uh, from the beginning. So we also would say that there is nothing to discuss. So, uh, for instance, that uh, this idea of a sacerdotal priesthood, non-sacerdotal churches would say, is a development in time and a development in history and an improper one at that. And that uh, the New Testament teaches an alternate form of official Christian ministry. Uh, whether that be uh, a single uh, pastor who's ruling over a local congregation and there's no structure above him or some sort of presbytery and multiple elders within a local church um, or even the idea that you still have bishops and presbyters but they are not sacerdotal. Um, so uh, Hansen uh, makes a very startling statement uh, and uh, it sort of launches his argument of the book. He says, If the assumptions upon which both points of view have long rested are destroyed, that's very strong language, I might add, as this book is intended to destroy them, so this is his negative thesis. Hansen is setting out to knock down both the sacerdotal church and the non-sacerdotal church understandings of official ministry. He is planning on knocking down both of these ideas that I just mentioned. He continues, Then it is obvious that we are faced with a new situation in which the whole question of Christian priesthood becomes uncertain and must be examined de novo or anew. So that's what he is doing, is that he really wants to get down to what have Christians down throughout the ages believed and is what is believed today original to the Christian faith? And if not, well, what are we left with? How do we move forward uh, with Christian ministry? He then states, there are no ministers in the early church or in the primitive church. This is a striking statement, but then he sort of fleshes that out a little bit. He says, there are no official ministers. And what he means by official ministers are officers who are appointed to fill official positions within the church who have themselves succeeded to officers filling these posts before them and who will in course of time be succeeded by other officers who will fill their posts when they are ready to retire or leave or die. Hansen states that in the earliest age of the church, no such, and that's the key word, such ministry as this existed, and therefore no such ministry in any of its forms can justly claim that it was instituted by Christ or his apostles. This is the key thesis. Nor that it has any particular right, particular right, to call itself exclusively scriptural. So that's his argument. His idea, um, and to me, what I sort of thought of in Hansen's mind, what he seems to be saying is that it seems that official ministry, as he just described it, is almost like somebody applying for a job opening with a company. You know, whether that be, you know, a company like McDonald's, you know, for like a cashier or a cook position or, you know, a Fortune 500 company like a big executive that you have a company that has a title or position and they list it in the job, you know, listing services, whether that be online like Indeed or Monster or pick your favorite job listing service, you know, or, you know, if you want to go old school like the newspaper where you have the job listings at the end, you know, uh, you know, Bob's, you know, uh, workshop needs a welder, you know, starting at, you know, $30 an hour, you know, please apply at, you know, phone number, you know, blank, 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 you know, blah, 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 blah. 
you know, he seems to almost have this idea of official ministry and this sort of wooden uh, sort of, you know, commercial economic kind of sense. Um, maybe I'm taking that a little bit too far, but I think that sort of would be an analogy for how he would uh, describe the official ministry that, you know, likewise, like all the businesses I just described are these hypothetical job opening situations. Churches can also have these kind of positions. You know, you think about in a lot of evangelical churches, whether that be smaller churches or, you know, especially in mega churches, you know, you have the assistant director of Sunday morning worship or the associate uh, minister for, you know, preschool children's uh, classes or the uh, assistant pastor for Sunday school uh, preparation, you know, and those are obviously hyperbolic examples of the kinds of, you know, obviously not New Testament based or, you know, even early church uh, understanding of what Christian ministry was. But he would also apply this to the imperial churches, uh, to the Roman Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox Church who would have you know, you have your cardinals and your college of cardinals and your patriarch and your metropolitan and your, you know, archdeacon and your archpriest and your archbishop. And, you know, you have these official positions. If you look at monastic orders, especially in the Roman communion, um, you know, all of these different, you know, Franciscans and Jesuits, and they all have their own, you know, levels of priest or monk, you know, who's in there, um, that none of these forms of ministry, whether we look at the most sort of Americanized evangelicalism or the highest of high churches, um, that uh, all of these uh, models for ministry are not native to the New Testament. And uh, he goes in uh, to talking about John chapter 20, which is a point that I made in the debate that my uh, pig-headed um, uh, opponent uh, refused to acknowledge or even consider, and that was from John chapter 20, uh, in which he refers to the twelve as uh, disciples uh, instead of apostles. And in doing so, Hansen is pointing out that the Apostle John is highlighting that any authority that had been conferred on them was conferred upon the whole church, not the ministry as such. And this is a very subtle point um, that even when I read this the first time, I had a hard time you know, understanding the nuance of what he was saying, but I think I get it. Um, an example that I sort of uh, thought of um, when uh, I read this line was uh, an example that Roosh V, who is the moderator in the debate, mentioned. Um, that uh, it's sort of a, an interesting uh, connection here. Um, so Rush converted from the Armenian Apostolic Church, which is in the loose collection of churches known as Oriental Orthodoxy or the Oriental Orthodox Church, which would be the Armenians and a good number of Syrians, Indians, Ethiopia, the Coptic Church probably being the most well-known of the Oriental Orthodox churches. These are uh, high churches that are not in communion with the Byzantine or the Eastern Orthodox churches, which would be like the Greeks, the Russians, the Serbians, uh, you know, the Ukrainians, the Romanians, people like that. Um, and uh, Rush was in the Armenian Apostolic Church before he was in, uh, before he converted to the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia. Uh, so he, upon his reversion, uh, supposed or alleged aversion, uh, reversion to the Christian faith, um, which I'm not going to go into Rush's personal conversion. Uh, I still have a lot of respect for him. Uh, you know, I was grateful that he moderated our debate. Um, but anyways, all that being said, uh, he mentioned that in the Armenian church, unlike the Roman Catholic church or the Eastern Orthodox church, when somebody would confess their sins, instead of going to a priest in the rite of confession um, or the sacrament of confession, that the sacrament of confession was the confessor confessing to the whole, well, that not the confessor, but the confessant was confessing their sins to the entire church. So instead of going into private and confessing your sin to uh, you know, the priest, 
that you would get up in church and you would actually confess your sins to the entire congregation, priest, all the way down to, you know, the, the smallest grandma uh, in the church, which I thought was a fascinating point that he brought up. And uh, I think it's something that Hansen really hits on, um, that in the early church, uh, in the earliest of the early church, um, authority was held with the entire local congregation. It was not held exclusively within uh, the eldership or within the episcopate. Um, that uh, there was a recognition that the congregation as a whole had authority, which is the point that Hansen makes that when John refers to disciples having the authority that is passed in John 20 instead of apostles, that is to all Christians who are in uh, the church um, that have the authority of forgiving of sin, forgiving sins, binding and loosing, um, but that it's not that they have this individually, but it's that as a local gathered body, they have this authority um, and that that gets extended over time. And so to me, it's interesting. Roosh talked about how much better the individual confession of sin was than the corporate confession of sin. And now I understand there's a place for individual confession where you go to your pastor or your minister um, to talk about very private matters and to like, look, I've had a failing in this area. I've sinned in this area. You know, I'm repentant, um, you know, before God, um, you know, and uh, telling that in private, in confidence. I think there's a place for that. But I think there is also a place for public confession of sin. And to me, it seems that while Roosh wants to get to that original church, and he believes that the Eastern Orthodox Church is the church that's founded by Christ, to me, it actually seems that the Armenian uh, practice of corporate confession may in fact be older and may be in fact uh, more ancient than the individual sacrament of confession that later, uh, that later developed in the Roman Catholic Church and in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, so I found that interesting. And I'll just say as a quick aside, that's actually my opinion uh, and my perspective. I think that many of the debates that Roman Catholics have with Eastern Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox have the older, more ancient practice than Roman Catholics do. However, when the Eastern Orthodox are in conflict with the Oriental Orthodox, I think that the Oriental Orthodox actually have, generally speaking, not in every case, but generally speaking, the older or more ancient practice than the Eastern Orthodox. Um, and uh, there's reasons for that, but I, I may get into that when I continue going through my uh, History of the Christian Church series with Schaff. But anyways, continuing on, uh, Hansen makes the point that none of the apostles appoint ex successors. And this essential ingredient for official ministry is thus missing from the New Testament. Now, this is where I'm going to start to get into a little bit of a disagreement with Hansen, and this is where, as we follow through the chapters, um, I'm going to really distinguish my own position from Hansen's position um, and uh, give you, the viewers, uh, my take um, while still trying to respectfully and accurately represent what uh, Bishop Hansen's thesis is. Um, and so he says that because the apostles do not appoint successors or that none of them, uh, let me back up, that none of the apostles appoint successors, that thus the essential ingredient for official ministry is thus missing from the New Testament. And this is fatal to the concept of apostolic succession as it has been traditionally understood. So, for instance, the idea of apostolic succession is not that we have apostles alive today, but that the bishops are the successors of the apostles, and that the apostles appointed bishops wherever they went um, in the various cities that they would go around in the Roman Empire and beyond to, be the, to have apostolic authority in the stead of the apostles. And so that once the apostles died, uh, and the last of uh, the apostles being John uh, died uh, towards the close of the first century, um, they had set up bishops in their place having apostolic authority. And so by imbuing these bishops with authority, those bishops then appoint their successors, you know, who then appoint their successors, who then appoint their successors all the way down throughout the ages so that 
for instance, in the Roman Catholic Church, you know, they claim that Peter would have appointed Linus or Cletus, you know, as the first bishops of Rome after Peter was, you know, shortly before Peter was martyred. And that from Cletus and Linus, you know, going down to Clement, who they would say is the fourth bishop of Rome, which Clement in his letters never claims to be that, um, that we have this unbroken chain of succession of bishops, of monarchical bishops. That means a single bishop in a single city uh, that you can trace down throughout the ages uh, to this day. And that when Christianity would spread, a bishop from one city would make sure that uh, the bishop of the sending city would then appoint a bishop in a new city. So for instance, you know, when Kievan Rus in the 900s converted to uh, Eastern Orthodoxy or Byzantine Christianity that the Patriarch of Constantinople then appointed a bishop of Kiev who then, you know, established the church in Kievan Rus who then, you know, as Kievan Rus, uh, you know, sent missionaries to the rest of what is now Russia, um, that as those missionaries would go into cities, they would appoint a bishop for each city or each village and uh, that there's been this successive laying on of hands that you can trace back. Um, so Hansen is saying that this is completely anachronistic, and I completely agree with him, because you don't see this in the New Testament, or even in the earliest of the Anti-Nicene Fathers. Um, and when you do start to see this, say in Justin Martyr and Irenaeus, these bishop lists conflict with one another. There's not the same line, it's not the same names in the same order. And uh, that's evidence that this is something that has come into being and that people are trying to post hoc anachronistically impose upon prior ages. Um, but then he makes another statement that there are no clergy in Paul's letters. And this is where we're going to have the disagreement. And as I go through and analyze Hansen's uh, argument, um, we're going to have to keep this in the back of our minds. Uh, I mentioned in my series, uh, my against series, and my, I think the most important of those videos, against liberalism, um, the concept of higher criticism. So this is my first real departure from Hansen. Um, and uh, it's something, like I said, we're going to keep in the back of our minds. Uh, <laughs> you can't sneak this past Dr. Bob, even if you don't call it higher criticism per se. It's clear that Hansen is arguing uh, from the assumptions of higher criticism, which is not surprising given the fact that he was in the Anglican Communion in the latter half of the 1900s, uh, or the latter half of the 20th century. Um, I may have mentioned this in my last Schaff video um, as well, or maybe in my upcoming Schaff video, but Schaff is actually living contemporaneously or sort of in the immediate aftermath of the rise of higher criticism in especially Germany and then it spread to the Netherlands and Switzerland and France and uh, Italy and even to England eventually. Um, so Schaff is living in the time uh, when higher criticism is on the rise. Um, you look at uh, what kind of churches are impacted by higher criticism and theological liberalism today. Things like the United Church of Christ, uh, which Jeremiah Wright, who is the pastor for Barack Obama, uh, studied under James Cone at Union Theological Seminary. Uh, it's a liberal Protestant seminary that uh, teaches, you know, that there wasn't really a resurrection. There isn't really a virgin birth. These are just, you know, sort of metaphorical or poetic things. Well, Paul didn't really write, you know, all the letters that are attributed to him. What higher criticism is essentially doing is, unlike lower criticism, which would be what we would think of as textual criticism, um, that higher criticism is not looking at the texts that we have in history. It's not, say, going through Codex Sinaiticus or Codex Vaticanus and trying to decide, well, which reading is original to the text. Higher criticism is sort of coming up with historical theories, Bart Ehrman, is a great example of a modern, modern higher critic um, who would say that, well, Paul really only wrote seven of his letters because only seven of his letters are written in a certain style that we would consider Pauline. And based off of historical facts and archaeology, which a lot of times they'll give you the correct facts, but they'll just give you their own take on them, their own sort of uh, 
subjective take uh, without saying that's what they're doing, that, well, he couldn't have written, uh, you know, First Timothy because First Timothy proposes a form of church government uh, and a form of church structure that just simply didn't exist in Paul's day. And they don't really give you evidence for that, uh, but this is the theories that have developed. You know, this goes all the way back to Friedrich Schleiermacher and then Ferdinand Bauer, uh, as I discussed in my uh, Against Liberalism. You know, the early 1800s German universities like the Tübingen School, um, and that has worked its way into pretty much every major American seminary today. Um, unfortunately, even... Recently, I think it's starting to come into Southern Baptist and uh, Evangelical seminaries. Um, maybe the Master's Seminary out in California, Covenant Baptist in Kentucky, haven't been affected, but it is everywhere. Princeton, uh, Harvard, Yale, Duke, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, all of these formerly good and godly uh, places that train Christian ministers are now training people who are essentially atheists or agnostic uh, who call themselves Christian ministers, but these people don't actually believe the Bible. And uh, Hansen, uh, while a great scholar and uh, seeming to be more conservative and more evangelical, um, I think that's probably due to tradition and the fact that he was living 50, 60 years ago when he was writing a lot of this. Um, you know, this particular book was over 40 years ago. Um, that many of the developments that have happened in society today, I'm not so sure Hansen would be as conservative as he is, uh, simply because he's actually operating from very liberal assumptions. Um, he doesn't call it higher criticism, but here's the quote uh, in chapter one. He says, but we must follow the more, quote, rational, <laughs> as if liberalism is rational, and scholarly method of accepting the results of, and here it is, historical criticism. That's just a uh, euphemism or a synonym for higher criticism. So when he talks about historical criticism, he is talking about higher criticism. Um, so here Hansen gives away his underlying presupposition of higher criticism. Um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Schaff has a discussion of higher criticism. It's actually in History of the Christian Church, Volume 1, Chapter 3. I just checked my notes. Um, Hansen speaks of, quote, Paul's, quote, authentic letters, end quote. Fatally, he excludes the pastoral epistles from his analysis, which are the very epistles that discuss Christian government and the form of Christian ministry that uh, the New Testament gives. Um, you know... Hansen talks about vocabulary, style, content, what I just mentioned, saying, well, this couldn't have been written by Paul because, you know, this is, you know, too developed of a form of church government in, uh, for Paul's time. As if we know, you know, as if we can, if we have any idea outside of the New Testament what church government would have looked like in Paul's time outside of what Paul tells us. So this is the problem with Protestant liberalism and the Anglican communion in particular. This is all my commentary right now. Um, to me, Hansen's use of historical criticism is going to color his entire thesis and to me leads to his goofy conclusions at the end of the book. But this is important. Um, an important aside I need to make right now, just because I disagree with somebody doesn't mean I cannot take great benefit from their work. Um, Hansen is going to talk about a lot of really important stuff and give a lot of really good early church and New Testament evidence for uh, various aspects of the Christian ministry. Um, he's going to do a remarkable job of doing this. But once again, uh, this is where I've heard James White often talk about our need to demythologize scholarship. Um, that uh, we need to understand that even the smartest people carry their own presuppositions and their own biases uh, into their work. And we need to recognize those when we see them. And we need to recognize our own when we see them. That doesn't mean that there's not a right or a wrong. Um, I'm going to you know, vigorously embrace some of the conclusions that Hansen offers, and I'm going to vigorously oppose other conclusions that he offers. 
Um, but this is one of the problems, uh, just as a last aside on my debate with Brother Augustine, I just don't think he had any concept of the fact that you can read from your opponent's point of view or read from somebody you disagree with and take benefit from their work, even though you disagree with them. Um, he claimed that he had read from our Confession of Faith. I don't even think he knows what the, 16th, the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith is, let alone having read the entire confession. Um, I think that was a bluster on his part. Um, but I think that was why I, once again, I believe I objectively, I'll let the debate speak for itself, but I think it's pretty clear objectively who won the debate, um, that uh, you have to be able to read people you disagree with, uh, especially when you're going into a debate context, to be able to read uh, and to appreciate and to understand and to take value um, from your opponent's perspective, or even somebody who's coming with a perspective that neither you nor your opponent would hold. Um, I think that's part of being honest. I think that's part of being humble and recognizing your own weaknesses. Um, and so with that, uh, I will say that uh, Hansen does make good points out of 1 Corinthians and Romans chapter 12 uh, in regards to the Christian ministry. He does say that there are elements of Christian ministry that are presented in what limited Pauline corpus he actually accepts, namely 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans chapter 12, um, where you hear discussion of apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. However, Hansen says these are descriptions of giftings, not offices, as we've discussed before. They are functions, not ordinations. He says permanent ministry is a development in church history, as was the New Testament canon, the creed, and by the creed he means the Nicene Creed, um, liturgy, and the monarchical episcopate. What is important is how we account for these developments. That is, is a development proper or is it not? When it is a development something that is a natural extension or a helpful extension of the faith that we see in the New Testament? Um, and when does it become something that is the kind of tradition that uh, Jesus would describe in Matthew chapter 15 that the Pharisees would hold to that actually violates God's word? So he jumps into authority in the primitive church. So as I mentioned uh, before, Hansen denies apostolic succession and the idea of a scriptural official ministry. Paul, says Hansen, never makes himself into an official. His personal authority as a, quote, official is nothing. Matthias is a replacement, not a successor to Judas. So he is talking about, you know, uh, Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, when the apostles draw lots after Judas has killed himself. Um, and uh, you'll often hear imperial church uh, advocates talk about, well, the word episcopate is used for, you know, let another take his office. Um, but what Hansen is saying is that, you know, this is, um, you know, he, he's uh, a replacement for Judas and the Twelve, that he's not succeeding to Judas's office, as if Judas somehow held this official office called apostle. Um, it's very interesting. Um, <laughs> he then goes, Hansen here makes a ridiculous claim that the early church had a rudimentary form of, quote, communism for structure. Uh, I think he, <laughs> once again, Hansen's a goofy Anglican. Uh, that's the, the term that I, I ascribe to all of my Anglican friends who may be listening to this. I, my conservative believing Anglicans. You know the goofy types in your own communion, so please forgive my, my jest. Um, but uh, <laughs> this is, once again, I'm just going through his argument. Um, he does make a good point, though, however, about consensus of opinions and authority within the whole church. If you look at Acts chapter 15, for instance, he'll reference this, that uh, this is something that while James is speaking on behalf of this, quote, council, even though the idea that this is a council is, 
is itself an anachronism uh, in like as if the Council of Jerusalem was an ecumenical council. It's clearly not. Uh, that's a later term that, you know, and a later institution that comes, you know, hundreds of years later. Um, but what you see is that the church there in Jerusalem, they come to an agreement, a consensus together. There's no disagreement there that uh, everybody assents to the verdict of what had been discussed within the church. Um, and that this is done with the authority of the whole church, not just with James as if he is the bishop, monarchical episcopate, the monarchical bishop, you know, the singular bishop of Jerusalem, and everybody is just bowing to his decision. It's like, no, this is, he is representing the entire church of Jerusalem. You know, this is our opinion. This is what we state. Now you can go and send this to the daughter churches that are in Syria and Asia Minor into the Gentile Christians who are starting to come into the faith. Um, the next section, Hansen talks about the priesthood of Christ, um, which this is something that I discussed heavily in my debate um, that was never interacted with. Um, he says, No New Testament writer claims Jesus was from the tribe of Levi or descendant of Aaron. And this is important. The main New Testament passage expositing Christ's priesthood is... Here we go. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through chapter 10, verse 18. Precisely. In fact, Christ's priesthood can be said to be the central aspect of the book of Hebrews. Exactly. I 100% agree with Hansen here. And that's the whole point of why I argued in the debate the way in which I did. The chief point of the book of Hebrews is to contrast Christ's priesthood from the Levitical, Aaronic, or Sadducean priesthood. Remember, all of the priests in the New Testament were of the party of the Sadducees. The Pharisees were the rabbis, whereas the priests were the Sadducees. Um, the book of Hebrews' apologetic content suggests that it was uh, written to Jewish Christians uh, and trying to prevent them from going back to Judaism, basically saying there's nothing to go back to. So um, Hansen then continues with his description of Christ's priesthood. So, in discussing Christ's priesthood, Hansen states that <clears throat> Christ's priesthood supersedes all other priesthoods, and it supersedes the Jewish sacrificial cult. Now, when he uses the term cult, uh, for those who are uh, lay listeners out there, cult is not talking about cult in the sense that we would discuss a cult, like you know the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, or even more extreme groups like the Branch Davidians. Cult is a technical term uh, from the Latin cultus, which is specifically referring to um, the idea of a, a sacerdotal rite or ritual. Um, so, for instance, like Roman gods, uh, you'd have a cult of Jupiter, you'd have a cult of Saturn, you'd have a cult of Mars in which you have specific rites and rituals and traditions uh, that would be dedicated to that particular deity. Um, and so the Jewish quote-unquote cult is essentially the temple service, uh, the uh, temple service with its attendant uh, priesthood uh, in which you had sacrifice for sins uh, to um, uh, the God of Israel, uh, and uh, that was the cult quote-unquote of the people of Israel. Um, so that is just as an aside. Uh, Hansen sort of continues that uh, Christ's priesthood is a priesthood to end all priesthoods. It is effective, actually achieved, not past tense, uh, those who are involved in the Christian system. His priestly activity is final. No need for renewed sacrifice or offering. His intercession makes all other forms of intercession unnecessary. That is the key point. And that was the key thesis that uh, I attended to in my debate. Um, Romans 10.4 is brought into evidence. Christ is the telos, that is the end, the fulfillment, the finality, um, the end result of the law. After he has offered himself in supreme obedience, no other offering can be of any significance. 
and this is where Hansen's going to discuss it and where I discussed it as well, that the idea of the Eucharist as some sort of sacrifice for sins, that it's propitiatory, that it is somehow the same sacrifice of Christ that is ongoing again and again and again just doesn't make any sense given the uh, thesis of the writer of Hebrews. He gives a quote, uh, Cultic sacrifice such as the Jews practiced and such as several pagan religions in different forms also practiced formed by the uh, formed no essential part of Christianity at all. That is, the Christian religion knows no special priesthood. It knows no special sacrifice. Why? Because we only have one priest and... He's already made his one sacrifice. Therefore, the idea that there would be a continuing sacrifice is just, it doesn't make sense. And that's one of the reasons when I hear imperial church advocates talk about, um, you know, well, our form of worship is really recapitulating the Old Testament form of worship. And they act like this is a, a strength or a benefit um, or a, a positive to their system. To me, that makes me want to run as far away from that system as possible um, simply because uh, if you're arguing that you're, the way that you're doing things is in continuity with the Old Testament in the sense that it's in continuity not with you know, the prophetic aspect or the, uh, the messianic aspect of the Old Testament, but that it's in continuity with the sacrificial aspect of the Old Testament, that's, that's a big problem. Uh, and uh, I think uh, is is really tough to reconcile, and I would say it's impossible to reconcile with the uh, the argument that uh, Paul makes in Hebrews. Um, so he then goes into Hansen goes into talking about the priesthood of all believers. So we have this one priest, Christ. He is the high priest, and yet believers, Christians, are also called priests. He says this is entirely consistent with Christ's new and permanent priesthood. There are four New Testament passages, 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5, and verse 9, Revelation 1, 5 through 6, Revelation 5, 9 through 10, and Revelation 26. These all teach the general priesthood of all Christian believers. Christians are a peculiar people, set aside and consecrated as priests to proclaim the gospel. So that is our sacrifice, is the proclamation of the gospel. Authority in the early church was communal in the sense that all believers were priests and it was not, you had no official priesthood. When Christ founded the church, he made no distinction between the clergy and the laity. That's the key distinction in uh, the first Peter passage in which uh, the entire church is, uh, has language that is used from Exodus describing that you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, is to, used to describe the entire church not merely the official ministry. Um, this was one of the issues uh, dealing with Roman Catholicism uh, that I think John MacArthur pointed out uh, in his series on the Pope and the Papacy, that uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, the priesthood was the church and that the laity were merely sons and daughters of the church. And uh, in that sense, uh, you had a perversion of this text in First Peter and a perversion of this idea um, by saying, well, we do believe that all the members of the church are priests, but only the priests are the members of the church. Everybody else is merely in communion with the church. Um, I'm not sure that Catholics would argue that today, but that seemed to be uh, part of uh, Roman thought uh, in the Middle Ages. So um, uh, he continues, you know, there is no distinction between clergy and laity when Christ founded the church. Um Therefore, it is not of dominical nor apostolic. It is not a dominical or an apostolic institution. Um, so uh, here's some things from history that uh, uh, Hansen then quotes. So first, Clement, the laity can't depose clergy irresponsibly, uh, not that they can't depose clergy at all. So he's saying the problem with the, the church in Corinth uh, that Clement is writing to about a generation after the Apostle Paul wrote to Corinth, um, the problem was not that they deposed their elders. It's the fact that they deposed them uh, in a bad manner and for the wrong reasons. 
if you have a bad uh, uh, elder, if you have a bad overseer, like, yeah, he needs to be deposed. Um, but not for selfish reasons uh, and not in an improper or an unorderly uh, fashion. Um, and uh, what the church at Corinth did was actually sinful by kicking out good elders and good men due to the uh, factious words of a few. Uh, he then talks about Ignatius. Uh, Ignatius acknowledges bishops, but as a way of introducing the whole church. So when Ignatius addresses the bishop, that's his way of addressing the whole church in the context when you read Ignatius' seven letters, I think it's clear. Uh, then he uh, brings in evidence from uh, Justin Martyr, uh, who extensively discusses the priesthood of all believers. Um, and there's an, a special passage in Dialogue 116.3 uh, in which Justin definitely lays out the priesthood of all believers or the priesthood of all Christians. Um, he then talks about Origen and Clement of Alexandria, who also affirmed the priesthood of all believers. So these are early Antinocene writers. And then uh, Hansen discussed other priests who are in the New Testament. Uh, here's a quote. Having investigated the origins of the concept of ministry in the early church and the, early, uh, and the nature of that authority at that period, and having traced the doctrine of the priesthood of Christ in the New Testament and that of the priesthood of all believers from the period of the New Testament to the middle of the third century, we must now ask the question, and this is a good question, does the New Testament recognize any individual minister as a Christian priest in virtue of his being a minister? And then Hansen continues, the reader will not be surprised to find that this question must receive an answer as answer an emphatic negative. That is no. There is no special priesthood in the New Testament. It's just not there. We have the priesthood of Christ, the Melchizedek priesthood, where Christ is described as having this unique priesthood of which he is priest and high priest, that he is the one who offers a once-for-all sacrifice. And then we have a general priesthood of believers that, you know, we are the royal nation, the holy priesthood, um, and that uh, this is something that applies to every Christian believer. There is no foundation in the New Testament for calling elders, overseers, deacons, anyone else uh, who has a, uh, apostles, prophets, teachers. There, uh, there is no evidence and no uh, basis for describing any of these functions or ministers within the church as priests. So uh, Jewish priests uh, are present in the New Testament, but there is no mention of Christian officials as priests whatever. 100% agree with Hansen there. He says, outside of Acts 13.2, where a verbal form of liturgy is used, and this use is a stretch as the men are referred to as prophets and teachers. There is no other part of the New Testament where mention of a Christian, uh, of Christian official priests is even remotely likely. I think Father Mitchell Paquin, in his debate with James White, brought up Romans 15.6. And this is something I brought up in my debate to head off my opponent at the pass. Um, was that uh, when Paul talks about his priestly ministry, it's clearly metaphorical. He's talking about his proclamation of the gospel. There's no mention of like a Eucharistic sacrificial cult. Um, once again, I use the term cult technically. I'm not using it pejoratively. Um, it, it's, it's purely metaphorical. There is no sense in which Paul describes himself as a special priest, as if he has been ordained by Christ in some special way, um, other than being an apostle, um, as a, a sacrificing priest. That's just nowhere in Paul's vocabulary. It's nowhere in James's vocabulary or John's or Jude or any of the gospel writers, um, nor Luke uh, when he writes uh, Acts of the Apostles. Uh, on page 32, uh, Hansen admits there is a development of presbyters, overseers, and deacons as official ministers in later New Testament history. Which this is one of the things that, you know, once again, this is where the higher criticism comes in and where this is where I'm going to make a different conclusion than him at the end. Uh, whereas he says there is no official ministry. 
I understand what he's saying in one sense, but in another sense, it's like by discounting the pastorals uh, and that by uh, I don't think he really mentions first or second Peter all that much as well. I think he discounts uh, where the New Testament does describe in a sense an official ministry, even if it's not an official ministry as we would describe it today. Uh, but we'll get to that when we get there. Uh, and so that's the end of chapter one. Um, and so now in chapter two, the emergence of a Christian priesthood, Hansen is going to go into uh, the development of the Christian priesthood in the anti-Nicene period, uh, and then beyond Nicaea as well. So, uh, point. Theological interpretations are often given to institutions that developed over time for practical reasons. One of the things he uh, mentions is like the kind of clothing that later... Uh, you know, official ministers uh, in the later imperial church uh, war. You know, it was something that had an initial purpose of say, you know, you'd wear a particular kind of outfit because of weather or the, the season that you were in. Somehow, you know, as time went along, s theological significance began to be attached to these robes. Like a mitre's hat, for instance, would be one of these. Uh, that was something that apparently pagan priests would wear. Um, that just sort of got absorbed uh, into the later uh, uh, imperial church, uh, you know, attire. But uh, there's no initial uh, theological reason of uh, New Testament or a scriptural reason for having something like this, but you get later attachment uh, to that. Um, so he talks about the second century. Uh, no Christian priesthood is to be found in the New Testament. There is, in fact, no solid evidence that anyone thinks of Christian ministers as priests until about the year 200. And this is significant. Uh, he talks about the Didache. Uh, uh, section 13.3, uh, here's a quote. You must grant the first fruit to the prophets, for they are your high priests, the archiarevs, or hierus. Um Hansen says that this is an obscure reference that scholars today debate. There's no consensus about what is meant by prophets being high priests. Um, and furthermore, this is not attached to uh, elders or overseers. Um, he then talks about Ignatius in the letter of Philippians, chapter 9, section 1. The priests, hieris, or uh, hieris, are also good, but the high priest is better. This is a reference to Old Testament priest and to Christ. This is not a reference to a New Testament sacerdotal caste. Clement chapter 40 uh, through 44, only two offices uh, are uh, in Clement's mind when he writes this. The episkopos slash the presbyter. Clement uses the term episkopos or presbyteros, which we would say are bishop or uh, elder or bishop or um, yeah bishop or elder or overseer or elder he uses these terms uh, interchangeably um, uh, and that they are regarded as identical and Hansen mentions this as in Acts 20 28 uh, the shepherd of Hermas uh, the Didache and the pastorals there is no distinction between bishop and elder or bishop and presbyter in the New Testament or in the immediate um, ancient uh, anti nicene uh, writings uh, before the year 200. So it's not in the New Testament. The distinction between bishop and presbyter, it's not in the New Testament. It's not in the Shepherd of Hermas. It's not in the Didache. It's not in the pastoral epistles, and it's not in Clement. Um, and then the second office that uh, Clement mentions, or the second function or role that Clement mentions, is that of the deacon. So you have the uh, bishop presbyter, or the presbyter bishop. Uh, this is one person, or one uh, concept, uh, not a distinct concept. And then you have a deacon. Um, he uh, mentions Isaiah 60, verse 17. Uh, this is quoted by Irenaeus. The fathers take their model for ministry from the prophets, not the law. That is, you don't have this distinction as you have in the law between high priest, priest, and Levites. This is something that you will often hear Catholic or Eastern Orthodox, um, you know, maybe not your popular or average person saying this, but you'll see this in their more scholarly writings where they'll talk about this threefold distinction of ministry, um, whereas 
the church fathers in the New Testament only know this twofold distinction. Um, the next section is the beginnings of a Christian priesthood. Um, and this is where uh, Hansen um, uh, talks about the first emergence of this doctrine. But before that, we'll recap. So in the New Testament, Hansen is arguing um, you have elders and uh, bishops are one concept or one function, one role. There is no distinction between the elder and the bishop. And then there are also deacons or ministers, people who helped. Um, and so there is essentially a twofold uh, distinction in, in sort of functional ministry uh, as opposed to the later threefold distinction that develops between bishop, presbyter, and then deacon. And so uh, the distinction of the bishop from the elder is not native to the New Testament. It is not part of the deposit of faith. So anyone who would insist that there is a distinction between bishop and presbyter uh, in a dogmatic way are just wrong. They're just historically, uh, scripturally, uh, just incorrect. Uh, and this is something that is going to be brought up. Uh, he'll mention uh, St. Jerome, uh, who is one of the more interesting figures from church history, uh, making this argument later. Um, so then the next section is the beginnings of the Prist Christian priesthood. So the first mention of Christian, quote, priesthood is by Tertullian in 200 AD, which is interesting that it's not somebody who uh, either Catholics or the Orthodox uh, churches would view as a saint um, or as Orthodox. Um, Tertullian uh, refers to the bishop as the sacerdos. That's, that's our Latin term, sacerdos, where we get our term sacerdotal, means priest. In Latin, or sacerdos summa, the 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 sum, uh, the the high priest. Um, however, Tertullian does not explain his terminology or seem to draw any theological inference from the use of the term. So, Tertullian gives us the terminology, but he doesn't supply the same meaning that those of sacerdotal churches would apply to a Christian priesthood today. So, Tertullian, even though he uses the term sacerdos. He doesn't use it in the same way that it's used today. Uh, Hippolytus or Hippolytus of Rome uh, is the first to distinguish heavily between the bishop and the presbyter. Only the bishop is a priest and can ordain. The bishop is the priest par excellence, and Hippolytus is uh, uh, theology. Uh, and then uh, the next section, uh, Hansen continues on, uh, the reason for the emergence of a priesthood. Here's a quote. It is appropriate at this point to pause and ask why the doctrine of a Christian priesthood, which is absent from the beginnings of the Christian ministry, should have emerged in the third century. And then Hansen uh, makes the following observation. The chief reason is that it was thought necessary and appropriate in order to express the priestly activity of Christ. So in other words, all that we read earlier or that Hansen mentioned earlier in Hebrews chapter 4 uh, up through Hebrews chapter 10, that this is what Christ has done, that there was, felt that there was a need to have an expression of that in a concrete way within the church. So you had that priestly expression concentrated in what became the monarchical bishop, which we see the beginnings of in Ignatius' writings, um, even though even Ignatius' understanding of a bishop is different than the bishop today. Ignatius' understanding seems to be a, almost like a senior pastor role within a local church or a small area. It doesn't seem to have this diocesan uh, context that we have today, which I would argue that's true because the concept of a diocese actually came from pagan Rome with the emperor Diocletian, who after the crisis of the third century, uh, within the secular government of Rome, reorganized the provinces into uh, dioceses. Um, it's not that he did away with the provinces, but he reorganized the structure of the provinces in which the provinces uh, had dioceses. Um, and so it's not surprising that after Constantine, that bishops then began to have this diocesan uh, jurisdiction, whereas before, at least uh, in Ignatius, it seems to be within a single local congregation and then uh, in the anti-Nicene period, that gets extended 
to like a, an entire city, but not necessarily to a diocese uh, because dioceses hadn't been invented yet. So uh, here's another quote from Hansen. Uh, Perhaps it is significant that the epistle to the Hebrews after Tertullian, who refers to it only once or twice, intends to think that it was written by Barnabas is totally unused by the Western church into the middle of the 4th century. It does not seem to have been very influential in the Eastern church during the 3rd century. Clement of Alexandria and Origen and their references to it make it clear that its Pauline authorship was not securely established. This must have tended to reduce its influence, and I think this is vital. The downplaying of the writing of the Hebrews, the fact that the, the, uh, the letter of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, has disputed authorship in the early church, and the fact that you begin to have the separation of the church from the synagogue, the uh, followers of Jesus from the, uh, the what will later develop into uh, rabbinical Judaism. You're having that split um, at that time. And so the uh, Jewish character of the New Testament uh, is beginning to be lost as Christianity goes out into the wider Gentile world. Um, there's less of a background uh, in uh, Gentile Christians for uh, the significance of Old Testament passages. Uh, this is exacerbated by origins uh, allegorization or allegorizing tendencies or explanations of the Old Testament in which, well, the historical meaning is not the, the primary meaning. The, it's the deeper meaning. It's the, the, the allegorical meaning that we really have to get to. Um, and so due to Origen's influence, uh, as well as the split from the synagogue by the early church uh, and the fact that Hebrews was disputed, um, you begin to lose the balance and the background for uh, uh, fighting against, or um, let me see, um, uh, pushing back against a sacerdotalizing tendency of the Christian ministry. Uh, some uh, more passages that Hansen discusses, Zechariah 3, 1 through 5, is seen as the prime passage of uh, the sacrifice, um, Jesus as priest and bishop as representative. So, and once again, Hansen discusses the rise of allegorical interpretation, allegorical interpretation of the Torah with application to New Testament leaders. Uh, he says this is no easy task. Um, he also talks about the influence of paganism leading to the rise of sacerdotalism. This is probably not a conscious borrowing, um, but this is something that just due to the cultural proximity and the historical cultural background of uh, the Greco-Roman uh, Gentile converts who are coming into the church, that they already had this concept of priest in their pagan religion. Um, and while they emptied those terms of the pagan association, that uh, these terms began to be reappropriated uh, in the context of the Christian church. Um, and he discusses the concept or the term archiarus or high priest in the Greek East and sacerdos in the Latin West, uh, both being terms that were um, had pagan meanings, not just Christian meanings or Jewish meanings, um, and that this borrowing of terminology and cultural diffusion um, had an influence on the rise of the Christian priesthood as well. And then he discusses the influence of Judaism. Uh, he discusses the lengthening gulf between the church and Judaism, as we have previously discussed. Early Christianity wanted to distinguish itself from that official Jewish priesthood, regular sacrificial cult, and the hierarchy that was present in Judaism. However, by 200 AD, Christianity was no longer in a Jewish milieu as the temple was destroyed and the Jews were scattered from Judea and there was no more sacrifice. And the fact that all of these converts are coming in, the vast majority of them are not Jewish anymore. So, from there, we begin to see the development of terminology, uh, the terminology of the priesthood. But we still don't have the... Uh, sacrificial system that we later see in the high middle ages um, but that 
is where Hansen turns to next in his discussion of the Eucharistic offering in the early church. So early Christianity distinguished itself from Judaism and paganism by the fact that there was no material offering. Um, there was a uh, constant, uh, there was a, a lot of reference to what was called a pure offering, echoing Malachi 1.11. Uh, Justin Martyr makes reference to that, the idea that Christians offer up a pure heart, a pure conscience, a pure mind, a prayer, praise, and thanksgiving to God. Um, but this was not connected with the Eucharist, the idea of the Lord's Supper necessarily, but does sometimes come up in context with the Eucharist, such as the Didache. Uh, the sacrifice that Christians offer, uh, and this is uh, what Justin mentions in Dialogue 41, uh, 1 through 3, Apology 65, uh, 3, and Apology 67, 5, that the sacrifice that we offer Christ or God as Christians is ourselves. You think about Romans 12, 1, you know, that we offer up our bodies as a, the reasonable service to God, uh, the sanctification of our minds, um, the, uh, the purity of the repentant heart, that uh, that is what we offer up to God. Um, and what is conspicuously absent from Justin, as well as from Irenaeus, and these are two second, late second century writers, is that they don't connect the Eucharistic offering with the celebrant. So you'll often hear imperial church advocates, um, they will talk about, uh, well, the bishop walks in and that there's the Eucharistic offering or the Eucharistic uh, you know, celebration that is given. And yet there's no sense in which there's like an epiclesis or, you know, uh, the, the words of institution, you know, the hocus in corpus meum, uh, that that is never connected with what the celebrant is actually doing. It's just the fact that the whole church is partaking in this thanksgiving. Um, Tertullian, uh, once again, late second century, early third century, uh, that the offering that Christians make is a prayer. There's no connection with the Eucharist, uh, uh, of the Eucharist with Christ's sacrifice in Tertullian's mind. Uh, as mentioned, Tertullian supplies much of the vocabulary, but little of the theology of later Eucharistic theology. So he supplies the terminology of priesthood, of sacrifice, that kind of stuff. But the concept that he has is, very different uh, from what uh, you would see in an imperial church today. Um, Hippolytus uh, and his Didascalia Apostolorum, or the teaching of the apostles, um, prayer for the Holy Spirit in Eucharist makes no mention of the conversion of the elements. So he talks about when the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper is offered, that uh, there's no mention of the conversion of the elements. Uh, the bread becomes representation, an antitipos of the body, and the wine becomes the likeness, the homoia, or the homoioma of blood. But the table is never described as an altar, um, nor do the bread and wine cease to be bread and wine. Clement of Alexandria is brought into evidence. The Christian clergy in Clement are nowhere referred to as priests. Sacrifice of the church is the word in Clement's mind. This is from Stromatice uh, 7.6.32. Uh, the altar, the thysi, uh, please forgive me on the Greek pronunciation, the thysia sterion uh, <laughs> is the gathering of Christians united in voice and in mind for prayer not for uh, a sacrificial uh, offering of the Eucharist. Um, he does uh, mention that Clement describes the Eucharist as an offering, but there's no reference uh, to the bishop or a priest's capacity to celebrate. Once again, we're starting to see the elements of this develop, but it's not there yet. Um, and that they, people like Clement, Tertullian, Justin, Irenaeus, they don't have the same concept in mind that you see developed in the later imperial church. Um, Origen of Alexandria is mentioned. Um, now, Origen wrote a lot. Uh, was a wild-eyed heretic in some areas, but still very useful uh, in other areas. 
Origen uh, states that Christians have no temples or altars. Uh, this is in uh, reference and distinction uh, of the Christian faith to paganism. That God needs nothing. Christians have no material offering. That is, we're not bringing lambs or bulls or goats or, you know, some sacrificial animal, you know, to be sacrificed on an altar of Zeus or Mars or something like that. Or even in the same way that the Jews would offer those animals to the true God. Origen believes in a real presence of sorts, but in no way connects the clerical priesthood with celebration of the Eucharist. And I think that's really uh, interesting and important, is that what you're beginning to see in the 2nd and 3rd century, um, particularly by 200 with Tertullian, you begin to see Christian ministers described as priests, but there's no reference to them being able to offer up a Eucharistic sacrifice. And you're starting to see the Eucharist be described, you know, in rudimentarily, ter rudimentarily vague terms in a sense of having a real presence. But it's not described as a propitiatory sacrifice. So you don't see the connection yet between the Christian priest and a Eucharistic sacrifice that is not present in the 2nd and 3rd centuries until we get to about 250 AD and the writings of um, Thascus Cuprianus, uh, as uh, he would be of, referred to in Latin, or who we would refer to as St. Cyprian, St. Cyprian of Carthage. And this is where um, Hansen uh, really traces the first uh, concept of what later becomes what we would see in the imperial high churches with the priests, uh, the, cla the cast of priests offering a Eucharistic sacrifice. He says that Cyprian is the first to connect, quote, all the dots. One, there is a concept of an offering in Cyprian. Two, there is a conversion of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. And three, there is a division of priest and high priest. However, he makes some interesting comments on Cyprian. Why was Cyprian the first to sort of develop the synthesis of a sacerdotal priesthood offering a Eucharistic sacrifice? He says that Cyprian was unusual in some ways for anti-Nicene Christian writers. One, he was educated. That wasn't often true, um, other than guys like Justin Martyr, who was a Greek philosopher. Um, Cyprian was a lawyer. He was a rhetorician. He was a very brilliant man who was also... Uh, formally educated, um, what we would consider almost a graduate level of education. Cyprian was also of a noble class. Most Christians in the anti-Nicene period were poor. You had slaves and women, as Celsus referred to them, uh, common working class people, um, you know, sort of the bottom rungs of Roman society. Um, but Cyprian was of the nobility. He was a Roman citizen. He was and in virtue of his being a Roman citizen, he was culturally Roman. He was converted as an adult. Cyprian was not born uh, into a Christian home or into a Christian family, but he was essentially a pagan Roman living in North Africa um, who uh, came to Christ as an adult. Um, and so while he had a very sharp mind, he was formally educated and he was of nobility, he had little formal theological education having had a very short ministry, unfortunately. And the reason for that short ministry, I think Cyprian was only a Christian for 12 years. Um, first six years, he was uh, a convert. In the last six years, he was a bishop. And then he was executed. He was martyred for the faith. Um, this is, once again, during the crisis period of uh, the crisis of the third century in the Roman Empire, where you had the breakdown after the um, assassination of uh, Emperor Alexander Severus in 235, uh, up until the ascension of Diocletian in 284, you had roughly a 50-year period of uh, rule by barracks emperors. These were emperors who never visited the city of Rome because they would uh, be ascended and then they would die. Um, you had the breakaway of what later became called the Palmyrene and the Gallic Empires until the reunion of the empire by Aurelian in uh, 270 through 275. Um, and so uh, the army, which is where most of the emperors were being drawn from, so Trajan Decius, uh, who was uh, 
infamous for the DC and persecution. Um, uh, these were uh, men who came from the army who became emperor, and the army was the bastion of paganism. And uh, paganism was seen as the ultimate patriotism. You could almost see it in the way that people who are born in the country today, who, uh, you know, in the United States and more rural areas, um, who uh, support the armed forces and support the police, will often support, you know, uh, uh, the Christian church, you know. And so you'll see, you know, God and country services. Um, there was sort of an analogous uh, sense in the Roman Empire in which the worship of the old gods was seen as patriotic. And so Cyprian was living right in the heart of the crisis of the third century in the 250s um, and uh, was martyred um, as a result of the Decian persecution. Um, I don't believe he was martyred during the rule of Decius. I believe it was either during uh, Valerian's reign or during... Uh, Valerian's son Gallienus's reign, um, but needless to say, um, Christianity uh, from the time of Decius up and through the persecution of Diocletian, uh, which was the great persecution uh, that was instigated by Galerius, uh, Diocletian's junior colleague, um, things got really bad for the Christian church. So Cyprian didn't have a lot of time to really think through his positions in a consistent fashion particularly as an adult convert. Um, Hansen mentions that because Cyprian had little formal theological education, but he was such a brilliant and intelligent man, he was not able to see, quote, down the road, uh, the down the road, in quote, consequences of the positions that he held. So Cyprian could not have imagined what was coming in the high Middle Ages, you know, writing during the time of, you know, the 250s A.D., when you still had a Roman Empire. Um, he could not have seen what was going to happen with medieval uh, theology. Everything for Cyprian was splendidly simple. Um, and once again, this is not to criticize uh, Cyprian. Um, it's just to recognize that we all have our own theological blind spots and we're all colored by the times that we live in. And uh, I think that is especially true of Cyprian. Great man as he was... Um, he wasn't perfect in his theology, and I think we can all humbly say the same. Um, so Hansen continues, he discusses Cyprian's ecclesiology. He says, the episcopate, uh, according to Cyprian, is divinely instituted by Christ, who ordained the twelve apostles as bishops. This is interesting, because he doesn't, this is different from the concept, once again, of apostolic succession that we see today in which the apostles were not bishops. These were itinerant preachers. Um, they did not hold down a particular church in a particular city. Um, the apostles traveled around and preached Christ and established churches as they went. Um, they were not bishops, as we would see today. So, once again, here's some anachronism, even in Cyprian's uh, mind. All the bishops and presbyters are priests, according to Cyprian. Hence, the clergy are sacrosanct. There's a close association of the priesthood with the celebration of the Eucharist. And this represents a new development in the theology of the Christian priesthood. So now we're beginning to see in Cyprian the development of what we later call sacramentalism. And check out my video against sacramentalism to discuss uh, or to see a further discussion of this point. So Cyprian sacramentology. In offering the Eucharistic sacrifice, the priest is doing what Christ did. The close linking of priestly character of the ministry with its function in celebrating the Eucharist and particularly in offering a sacrifice, not just of prayer and praise as we had seen before in Tertullian and earlier writers, uh, not just of the hearts and consciences of the congregation, but of the literal body and blood of Christ. Nobody had shown an inclination to do this before. So Cyprian has developed a theological novum. This is, we don't see this prior to Cyprian. And in linking, and in this linking of priesthood and Eucharistic offering, uh, of this sort, Cyprian has taken a long stride towards defining Christian priesthood in terms of a sacrificial cult. 
And once again, this is not a pejorative term or a pejorative use of that term cult, but we're beginning to see the development of the sacerdotal priesthood with the sacramental sacrifice of the Eucharist that later develops uh, and that we see come to full fruition in the Middle Ages. So neither the doctrine of offering nor the thought of the clergy as priest had been associated with Christ's death. The offering hitherto had been the offering made by men, the offering of praise or of themselves or of the bread and wine for God to bless, not the idea that the bread and wine become a propitiatory sacrifice that forgives sins. Cyprian's doctrine transformed the Christian ministry as it was in the third century out of all recognition and led to the breakup of the unity of the Western church in the 16th century. That is a powerful statement by Hansen. Once again, a lot of respect for Cyprian. He wrote some very beautiful letters, had a lot of really good things to say, but I don't think Cyprian saw, as Hansen states, the consequences of this theological development within his understanding of the ministry and within his understanding of the Eucharist as a sacrifice. Another quote from Hansen, a church which began by contemptuously rejecting all forms of sacrifice, and I think what Hansen means is all forms of material sacrifice, except the most immaterial. So we offer our hearts, we offer our prayers, we offer our thanksgiving, our praise to God. Hansen continues, so a church which began by contemptuously rejecting all forms of sacrifice except the most immaterial has come perilously near to instituting its own sacrificial cult with altars and priests who offer sacrifices which whatever allowance we make for the imprecision of piety, that's what I would attribute to Cyprian, or the exaggeration of rhetoric, cannot be described as holy, immaterial, or spiritual. So by the time we get to Cyprian, now we begin to see this development. And so then uh, leaving the third century as the empire has stabilized under Constantine, and we now enter the Nicene and post-Nicene period, we enter the fourth century. And so Hansen begins, a seismic shift occurred in relationship between the church and the state. You have the rise of Constantine. Uh, so you have the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, uh, I believe in three, uh, 312, uh, with the Edict of Milan that comes afterwards. You know, there's a great movie, Constantine and the Cross, that uh, I recommend uh, you all watch. Uh, even if you know Constantine never really saw a cross in the sky that said, and a voice that said to him, in this sign, conquer, um, for historical value, I would say the Battle of the Mil Milvian Bridge, it's important to understand that story since it's such a consequential uh, event. Um, that's where Constantine, uh, who had been one of the Tetrarchs, uh, taking over for his father, Constantius Chlorus, um, in the West, um, marched upon Rome where the usurper Maxentius, who is actually his brother-in-law and the son of the former Augustus, uh, Maximian, uh, Constantine marches on Rome uh, with a smaller army and defeats the larger army of Maxentius. And it, so it goes, uh, and this is Eusebius of uh, Caesarea who writes this in his early church history that uh, uh, it was like the night before the battle or like a, a couple of days or so before the battle, Constantine, who was a pagan at the time, uh, you know, as Caesar, who was going to, um, you know, proclaim himself Augustus, was going and marching on Rome, and he saw a vision in the sky in which there was the sign of a cross and a voice who he ascribed to the Lord um, or to an angel said to him, in this sign conquer. And so he paints the shields of uh, his legionaries with the chi rho, which is the first two letters in the Greek alphabet of Christ's name. And that uh, that his army shows up with these strange symbols, according to his pagan opponents, uh, with the Cairo symbol uh, on their their shields, and they fight this battle, and 
Constantine is outnumbered, and yet his troops still win the day. And uh, he crosses uh, the Milvian Bridge, which uh, his opponent Maxentius had fallen off to off of and drowned in the, the Tiber River. And uh, Constantine enters Rome in triumph and uh, is proclaimed Augustus of the Western Empire. And he later becomes Augustus of the entire empire. Um, and uh, Constantine is then later baptized as a Christian. And so this epic defining event of the Battle of the Milvian Bridge and Constantine's rise to power has a massive impact on the relation of the Christian church to the Roman Empire and our understanding of what later became sacralism, which check out my video against sacralism for further discussion. So um, Hansen quotes, uh, it became an advantage instead of a handicap for ambitious and worldly and powerful people to become Christians. As clergy uh, were exempt from taxes under Constantine, uh, Hansen continues, it is easy to imagine how many people suddenly wanted to become Christians and how many middle-class curiales, so these are people liable to make compulsory town counselors, experienced a sudden vocation to holy orders. Because not only were you exempted from taxes, you were also exempted from civil service uh, as, a, as a, a Christian clergy member. So uh, I comment, you know, due to nominalism, the sacraments were made uh, difficult to access. Uh, Hansen mentions consecrated elements became dangerous to the communicant. Uh, so the altar was, quote, fenced. That is, you have all these pagans who are all of a sudden coming into the Christian church after the time of Constantine. And uh, you have all these unwashed, you know, heathen masses who are now flooding into the church. And how do you know who's a true Christian or not? Well... That's where you begin to develop this uh, sacramentology, where you have confirmation and, you know, holy orders and uh, really trying to fence in the sacrifice that Cyprian uh, had uh, begun to uh, propound. So uh, the clergy at this time began to borrow pagan titles, pontifex, so like Pontifex Maximus. This was ironically used by Tertullian uh, uh, over 100 years earlier uh, in a derogatory fashion uh, towards the pagan Roman priest, all of a sudden the Bishop of Rome is calling himself a Pontifex, uh, which was the title of uh, the Roman Emperor actually had the title Pontifex Maximus as the, uh, the chief uh, priest over the, uh, the Roman pagan sacrificial cult. Um, Acorypheus, uh, a master of ceremonies, uh, the epoptes, the seer, and the hierophant, uh, the grand master of the lodge. These are all terms that originally had pagan meanings that then began to be used by Christian clergy. Um, and uh, these helped to reinforce the mystique and the grandeur and the power of the clergy. And this is... Uh, uh, it's very interesting. This is actually quite uh, consistent with what the emperor had become. Uh, under Diocletian, you had the end of the Principate, uh, in which the emperor was seen merely as the first citizen among equals within the Roman Empire, to becoming the Dominate, in which Diocletian preferred to be mentioned as the lord of the people, as opposed to the princeps or the princeps, uh, the first citizen. And so Constantine continues the idea of the dominate in which the emperor became difficult to access and had all his royal robes and jeweled, you know, diadems of a crown. And, you know, uh, you had, uh, you know, the imperial purple, um, which had been worn before, but now began to take on this sense of now the emperor is a lord, he is a king, he is a monarch, he is not merely the lead representative of a republic. Um, and so it's not difficult to imagine the same sort of mystique and inaccessibility that you begin to see with uh, secular rulers um, also leaks into the church, which had become intimately uh, intertwined with the Roman government, hence, which is why I call the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church imperial churches, because they have their structure and their origin within uh, this time period right here. 
So um, John Chrysostom, uh, uh, John of, uh, I forget where he was from, um, he writes a book called De Sacerdotio, which is on the priesthood. Now, once again, we look at when is Chrysostom writing. He's writing towards the end of the 4th century, beginning of the 5th century. This is 350 years after the time of Christ. That would be like me today trying to write about the Siege of Vienna in 1683 um, for a time period reference, um, or the, the founding of the, the Cape Colony by the Boers in South Africa in the 1650s. Um, so we're talking about a long period of time uh, removed from the culture and the context of the New Testament. Um, once again, John Chrysostom, a lot of helpful things to say, but once again, he's being colored by the theological developments of his time and of prior generations. So in his work, uh, De Sacerdotio, um, he wrote to Basil um, as a deacon. So John was a deacon at this time. He was not ordained as a priest. Um, however, he was writing this work to become a candidate for the priesthood. He uses Hirosuni, or Hirosune, that's priesthood, and hierus, or hierebs, um, uh, not presbyter. So he uses the term priest and priesthood, not presbyter. He calls Peter the Corpheus of the apostles. Once again, he's borrowing from pagan uh, religion here and applying it to the apostles. He compares Elijah uh, calling down fire from heaven um, upon uh, the offering on the altar and says this is analogous to what the Christian priest does. He says the Eucharist is a, quote, most terrifying performance. And this is where, uh, you know, the, the idea of the mass, the Roman mass as a spectacle, uh, something that you look at that you don't actually fully participate in. It, it's literally a spectator sport, so to speak. Um, that uh, priests have this immense power to control entry to heaven and hell. Um, by Chrysostom's time, the thought of the priesthood of all believers has completely disappeared before the priesthood of the clergy with the exclusive capacity to control access to God. The sanctuary begins to be veiled with incense. Anytime you go into... Uh, you know, a, a high church today, you'll see the priests, you know, walking down the, the aisle with the incense. And, you know, you have um, this almost uh, uh, deadening experience. And I don't say that in a strictly negative way, but uh, this magical, uh, almost mystical experience where you have all the the perfume of the incense, you know, that uh, fills the room, you know, with the uh, solemn liturgical language being said, and you know, in the priestly vestments, um, that uh, you had um, this veiling of uh, the Eucharist. I mean, you see it um, in the Orthodox Church where uh, it's behind the iconostases, um, and that uh, the Eucharist is kept there until it is processed out. Um, uh, in uh, the liturgical practice, and you see this within the Roman Mass, in which you'll see uh, the pyx and the ciborium, in which the the bread is put up on an altar um, with a golden uh, ciborium that uh, holds up uh, the, the the wafer uh, to be worshipped and genuflected before uh, by uh, the uh, communicant within the Roman Communion. Um, that uh, you're beginning to see the start of this by the end of the 4th, beginning of the 5th century. Um, and Hansen mentions, by this time, a screen between the clergy and the laity had been laid. And uh, give me one second. There's a quote that he has. So yes, uh, there's a quote from A.H. Uh, uh, Curitan uh, that... Uh, um, Bishop Hansen finishes off chapter 2 with uh, from the book The Eucharist Before the Middle Ages, page 183, uh, quoting Curitan. The Eucharist is a terrifying mystery. It is best performed and indeed received by the professional clergy. Its prayers should be recited silently. Its ceremony should be carried out invisibly. Only at a great 
Only at certain great moments should it be displayed to the laity. The splendid screen is central to the majestic drama which is played out before and behind it. End quote. And so uh, Hansen finishes chapter 2 saying, In short, by the end of the 4th century, the doctrine of the Christian priesthood has developed to the point where the clergy are fast becoming a sacerdotal caste. Um, and so that ends chapter 2. Uh, we'll continue on in chapter 3. But just a quick note uh, that uh, I have to mention before being accused of anachronism. Uh, Cyprian was a Roman citizen, um, but by the 250s, all freeborn men within the Roman Empire had been given citizenship, but Cyprian was descended from people who had citizenship before this time. Uh, I believe it was in 212 AD, you had the Antonine Decree um, by the Emperor Antoninus, who uh, we in history refer to as Caracalla, had uh, made all freeborn men within the Roman Empire citizens. And he did not do this out of the benevolence of his heart. Caracalla was quite a monster of an emperor. But uh, he did this for taxation purposes, to basically get more people on the tax rolls uh, to fund uh, his military expansionism. But uh, Cyprian had come from upper class that I believe had been citizens for a longer time than just the Antonine um, uh, prior to the Antonine Decree by Emperor Caracalla. But uh, I'd be open to uh, hearing more in the comments uh, from you folks uh, if you find any more information in that regard. So, uh, continuing on to Chapter 3, the development of episcopacy and the priesthood. So this is where Hansen is going to talk about the distinction between the presbyter bishop of the New Testament and the Antinocene period to the full-blown development of the diocesan episcopacy, which is central to claims of apostolic succession and the function of the priesthood as it developed into the Middle Ages and as it continues to this day. So the early bishop. Uh, it is not true, this is quoting Hansen, to say that episcopacy was instituted by Christ and his apostles. Agreed. Christ and his apostles did not make monarchical bishops. The monarchical episcopate was... Indeed, a development. <laughs> I love he gives a quote from Jerome here. He says, uh, Jerome maintained that it came out of the presbyterate. That is, the idea that Christ and his apostles uh, ordained elders. Um, and this I actually do agree with. Um, and that uh, the episcopate developed out of the eldership in which one of the elders was elevated over the others uh, to serve uh, as the bishop. Uh, and there's a funny quote he gives from Jerome here. Uh, let me uh, read that. Uh, <laughs> oh, a funny quote about Jerome. Uh, he says, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, it is not even accurate to say uh, that originally bishop and presbyter were the same office, and in consequence, episcopacy developed out of Presbyterianism. This has often been maintained ever since Jerome at the end of the 4th century Perceiving that the historical pedigree of episcopacy as of an apostolical institution was far from well established, claimed that there was no essential difference between a presbyter and a bishop. Jerome himself, of course, I love this quote by Hansen, was a presbyter and mercifully for the peace of the church, not a bishop. <laughs> Jerome is uh, everyone's favorite curmudgeon in uh, church history, and I say that with all affection and uh, respect for uh, the venerable, uh, if at times irascible, St. Jerome. So um, Hansen uh, maintains that the episcopacy, uh, episcopacy appears to have been ultimately tied to the financial management of the church and as the repository of tradition. And so that seems to be where it develops. Hansen mentions that originally apostolic succession did not mean succession by consecration. Instead, it was sound and authoritative teachers of the faith in the office in the same place. This is uh, from the 2nd and 3rd century. The church chooses and ordains as bishops those whom it perceives and ordains uh, to have, or it perceives, well, the church chooses and ordains as bishops those whom it perceives uh, uh, to have been endowed by the Holy Spirit with the charisma of seeing truth better, more clearly, more deeply than others, what perhaps Paul would have called, quote, the word of wisdom. The bishop 
thus was preeminently a pastor. And think about how far that is from many bishops today. I think specifically about Francis there in Rome. Uh, is this guy an exegete? Is he a pastor? Like maybe he gives kind words to, you know, little boys who had, uh, you know, fathers who were atheists, you know, falsely telling them that it's okay, your dad can go to heaven. Um, that's, once again, liberalism uh, eking in. Um, but you think about, you know, how political so many bishops have become and uh, the um, power that many of them wield and uh, how divorced many of them are from a local congregation of actually knowing their people, shepherding them, teaching them the word, going verse by verse through scripture. Um, and this is something Hansen is going to return to later, um, but I very much agree with uh, the spirit of what he is going to say. Uh, so he continues, the monarchical bishop was thus a development of convenience um, that had no claims of apostolic foundation in the early period. In the Middle Ages, though, there was a big change, uh, especially in the West, which, once again, we have to look at the difference between the Western and the Eastern Church uh, in political, cultural terms to see many of the changes in ecclesiastical terms. Um, after the Western Empire fell in 476, um, and it had been falling even before then, uh, it fractured into many, many different petty fiefdoms and kingdoms, um, later somewhat reunited by Charlemagne, uh, but in a lesser form than it had been. And uh, even after the death of Charlemagne, uh, the Holy Roman Empire um, uh, is not nearly as big as uh, the Carolingian Empire under Charlemagne. And uh, you begin to have the development of nation-states and... Uh, you know, wars between these nation states, uh, and uh, that's the situation in the West. There is no unified emperor remaining in the Western, uh, uh, the Western Church. And so uh, the Bishop of Rome uh, at that time really becomes elevated as being the only sort of unifying or stabilizing force in what had once been the Western Roman Empire. And if you look at the, the, the ancient pentarchy of the church, uh, Alexandria, Jerusalem, Antioch, Constantinople, and uh, Rome, only one of those was in the Latin-speaking West. So you begin to see the development uh, out of the ashes of the Western Roman Empire, uh, the high uh, uh, authority of the Bishop of Rome and the beginnings of what we see in the medieval papacy, um, till by the time 1099 comes around, you have the Pope literally summoning all the kings of Western Europe, uh, Western and Central Europe, uh, under his banner to go fight uh, the Saracen uh, and uh, the Muslims in uh, the Holy Land. Um, that's not the situation in the East. Uh, the emperor lasts for another thousand years in the Eastern Church. Um, and even when the Slavs are brought into Byzantine Christianity, they're looking to the emperor in Constantinople and to the patriarch who is there uh, as their spiritual head. Um, uh, but even still, you have powerful churches, and even under Muslim rule in places like Syria and in Egypt and in Armenia, and you have a much more decentralized uh, model of authority, uh, ecclesiastical model of authority in the East because you have a more central political authority in the East, whereas it's the exact opposite situation in the West in which you have a very centralized ecclesiastical authority uh, to maintain the unity of the faith uh, in the midst of political decentralization. And so uh, you're going to see differences in uh, Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox uh, and also Oriental and Assyrian uh, Church of the East uh, understandings of uh, uh, bishops. And the biggest thing we see in the Western Church is the growing gulf between the bishop and the presbyter. 
in the early church, Hippolytus in apostolic tradition, that's the, the Doscalia Apostolorum, uh, records uh, the bishop would meet with the presbyters every morning. <laughs> Country bishops, uh, so this is, uh, I believe, the uh, core bishop or the core episcopates, which is actually where the term priest comes from in Arabic. So akuri comes from the core bishop. Uh, this is actually a bishop who did not have his seat in a major city, but was uh, a bishop who was seated in the countryside. Um, so he would go amongst the farms and the fields, uh, amongst a, a more rural area as opposed to an urban bishop. Um, however, that uh, was an institution that uh, Hansen mentions was rare, um, and the core episcopate today is subjected under a, an urban bishop. Um, he says parishes in the modern sense were non-existent. And once again, this is due to the development of the diocese after Hippolytus would have been writing uh, during the time of Diocletian and then the subsequent organization of the church along those lines. Um, the bishop was constitutional in Hippolytus's writings. Presbyters were thought of as the bishop's men, his staff, and not as men responsible for their own congregations. So hence, we see this almost like the bishop is like a senior pastor and the presbyters like assistant pastors. By the 4th century, uh, that's when things really began to change. And once again, we've already talked about the political and cultural and societal reasons for that. Um, the bishop took on legal responsibility, so he would hear judicial cases, uh, both civil and in some cases criminal. Uh, the bishop began to administer estates, so he had workers and lands. This is the beginning of feudalism that we see uh, after the end of the crisis of the third century. Um, Chrysostom actually mentions the legal aspects of the bishop in De Sacerdotio. And then uh, Hansen mentions as well the collapse of the Western Empire. You have the loss of the Western Empire emperor. You have the collapse of the judicial system as the Western Roman Empire collapses and fragments. And you have the arrival of powerful barbarian warlords who are uneducated. You think about the Franks and the Saxons and the, uh, the Burgundians and uh, the Lombards, the, uh, the various Gothic tribes, uh, all these Germanic uh, barbarians who are taking over you know, France and Spain and England and uh, you know, the rest of Germany proper and even into Italy. Um, so the bishop... Uh, in the Western world became more than ever identified with his local area as a political and social leader. leader. Goths, uh, the Goths, for instance, would use Christian bishops as intermediaries with, uh, in their dealings with the Romans, uh, Ambrose of Milan being a uh, prime example of this. Barbarian kings would use Christian bishops as civil servants. Bishops became proprietor of land and helped lay the foundation of feudal Europe. During the First Crusade, Anna Comnena, this is interesting, she was uh, a Byzantine princess, the, uh, the daughter of the Byzantine emperor, uh, and she was used to Eastern bishops who, uh, because you still had the emperor uh, in the East, uh, bishops took on fewer of these uh, sort of political roles. She was horrified that among the Western barbarians, Bishops actually led armies and fought in wars. You think about uh, Pope Julian, who was right before the time of Martin Luther, literally fighting against the Venetian Republic, you know, mounted on his horse with armor. And uh, it's, it, was, it must have been a shock to, uh, you know, the Byzantines, uh, who, you know, the Eastern Romans, to, to see, you know, Frank, Frankish and Saxon and, you know, Gothic and... Uh, you know, other uh, Western, um, you know, bishops actually leading military forces into battle, uh, which I guess if you live in the Dark Ages and uh, stuff is not easy uh, and uh, the bishop's the only guy around uh, to, to lead men into battle, well, I guess that's his civic duty at that point. Um, so the popular image of bishops uh, became one of high politics. They were warriors, statesmen, rulers, judges, financiers. Uh, 
But once again, this was far removed from the episkopos that we see in the New Testament of one who functions as a pastor or a shepherd of his flock. But the cultic sacrificial duty, the Eucharistic sacrifice, was not forgotten. During the Middle Ages, the bishop went from being the priest par excellence to just being a super presbyter. You had a development in Eucharistic doctrine led to the corresponding development of the doctrine of the priesthood and holy orders. And so you no longer have the bishop with the presbyters as his attendants um, in the Middle Ages, but the bishop essentially is like a super priest. Um, you know, the, the priest or the presbyter at the local parish level uh, does basically all the same functions as the bishop. He's just of a lower uh, degree, uh, a lower order, or uh, a lower rank uh, in the same caste as uh, the, the, in the, in the same hierarchy as the, uh, the bishop. So priest had the power, uh, and he uses the Latin term, the potestas, of consecrating elements so as to affect the conversion of the elements. Excuse me, I just had a glass of water and it went down the wrong way. Um, uh, back to uh, uh, Hansen. Um, the priest, uh, you know, because he had the potestas, the power, he could literally call down God from heaven, even on behalf of the dead. This is especially true in Roman Catholicism. Um, and once, uh, once a man was a priest, he must necessarily always be a priest. He had the indelible mark that was left upon him. You don't quite see the same development in the East, uh, but uh, this is uh, especially uh, true of Roman, Catholic, uh, of Roman Catholic uh, theology. The bishop then became no important than the priest because both were defined by their cultic function, that is, the Eucharistic offering. So now, in this milieu where you have, especially in the West, bishops becoming these almost political figures and... Uh, they really lose their pastoral emphasis. <clears throat> this leads to a reaction in the Reformation. So this, according to Hansen, called the, the Reformation, called the entire concept of a sacerdotal priesthood into question. The sacerdotal system was being exploited in order to gain for Christian people spurious merit in this world and illusory remission of punishment in the next. You think about John Tetzel uh, going around, the indulgence preacher, and I'm specifically referring to Catholicism, Romanism at this point. Um, you know, a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory shall spring. Um, this idea of the thesaurus meritorum, the treasury of merit in which Christ and the saints have excess merit, and that the sacerdotal priesthood could... Uh, using their sacerdotal power, call down Christ from heaven in the Roman Mass uh, to uh, be a propitiatory sacrifice for people so that both their, uh, the temporal punishments of their venial sins could be forgiven in an indulgence um, and that uh, they could uh, gain uh, infused righteousness through the uh, uh, partaking of the Mass. This is the, the doctrine of Romanism that uh, Luther was reacting against. So Hansen continues, Above all, the Reformers objected to the medieval doctrine of the Eucharistic sacrifice and altar and offering. The sacerdotal priesthood was a reversion to the Jewish sacrificial cult and placed a priesthood between God and men, effectively abolishing the priesthood of all believers. The reformers struck at the doctrine of the priesthood wherever they went. They opposed transubstantiation, encouraged clergy to marry. The mass was turned into communion of the whole congregation, uh, a thanksgiving service for redemption and commemoration of Christ's atoning work and little else. So uh, I think it's very interesting. Um, both the, the, the Eastern churches would also have opposed transubstantiation and encouraged their clergy to marry, but for very different reasons. Uh, but it must be remembered uh, that the Mass in the medieval period, oftentimes the laity were denied the elements. This goes back to the earlier point that uh, Hansen mentioned, that uh, 
you had a fencing in of the altar uh, during the late Roman period um, because of all the uh, pagans who were coming into the church. And uh, uh, the, the Eucharist became something that only the priests and the deacons, that the clergy would partake of, at least in the Western church. And uh, that uh, the, uh, the laity were not communicated. They, they did not uh, receive the elements. Um, because what happens if you spill some of the wine? Uh, on the ground. Uh, well, you've just spilt Christ on the ground. Um, so this was what was vigorously opposed by the reformers who began to re-communicate uh, the laity by offering the bread and the wine. I know James White has mentioned stories of, you know, when you would have the bread and the wine offered in the early Lutheran services, like the entire town would be gathered at the church, literally cramming through the door to be able to partake of the bread and the wine that had been denied to them by the Roman priesthood. Um, so Hansen continues, The sacrifice uh, of the Eucharist became an offering of ourselves with the pure and contrite spirit of prayer and of praise. This is a return to the pure offering that we see in the early church. With the disappearance of the sacerdotal ministry in Protestantism came disappearance of apostolic succession. Uh, this is where Hansen states uh, disagreement uh, in ministry, in the doctrine of ministry among the reformers is due to the fragmentary nature of evidence. This is, once again, Hansen's higher criticism coming out where he's saying, well, the reason you have all these competing narratives of, you know, church ministry is because, well, it's, it's incomplete. We don't actually have a full Christian ministry in the New Testament, and this is because Hansen denies the pastoral epistles, and it would not be surprising to me if he also denied First and Second Peter, as well as uh, maybe the Catholic epistles other than James. Uh, however, uh, as uh, beautiful as uh, the things that happened of the Reformation, this sparked a reaction in Rome, and so Hansen discusses the Counter-Reformation. <laughs> the Reformation did not change Rome's opinion of the priesthood, but rather solidified it and codified it. So Rome actually became hardened in her position, uh, and this is especially true in the Council of Trent. And we see this in the activities of the Jesuits, especially uh, in the Counter-Reformation. Uh, so this is where Hansen, though, comes to discuss uh, his own tradition, the Anglican Communion, um, which the Anglicans uh, have a term, a Latin term called the Via Media, the Middle Way. Uh, <laughs> for those of you who are familiar with the social justice controversy that is raging uh, in our own present time, uh, you may have heard people criticize a so-called, quote, third wayism, in which, well, we're neither Republicans nor Democrats. Uh, you know, we are, you know, all about the gospel, and it transcends political parties. Um, I won't get into that discussion now, but uh, the Anglicans were the ones to invent third wayism. Um, so it's interesting. The Anglican bishop on the one hand, was not sacerdotal. Uh, this was against Catholicism. But on the other hand, the Anglican bishop was distinctly Episcopal, contra the Puritans and the Congregationalists who got rid of the monarchical episcopate. So it's interesting that you see a preservation of an Episcopal form of church government within Anglicanism, and yet it's divorced of the sacerdotalism that you see within Rome or the Eastern churches. <laughs> And uh, that's what Hansen finishes chapter 3 on. And so now we approach uh, the last chapter, uh, chapter 4, the meaning of Christian priesthood. And so this is where we get to Hansen's conclusions. And he talks first about the significance of the ministry. So he asks a question, what is the account in theology of ministry? Quote, any theory of ministry which states that official ministers of any name or form, as we know them today, in the church, and have known them for 15 centuries or more, were instituted by Christ and his apostles, is wrong, and based on a false premise, and cannot result in a satisfactory theory of ministry. So once again, recall, Hansen thinks the pastorals are forgeries. The desire to trace one's own form of ministry to the apostles to the apostles must be resisted. I agree with him to an extent here. Um, we have to even recognize uh, within our own confessions, and I'm coming from a more um, 
uh, reformed perspective uh, following after Calvin in the Institutes. Even though I'm a Baptist, I'm a reformed Baptist uh, holding to the 1689 and uh, recognizing that uh, our form of ministry is similar to our Presbyterian brethren, though somewhat distinct uh, beyond the, the local church because um, they have a board of elders uh, over uh, uh, multiple local church congregations, uh, and then you have multiple elders within local congregations. Whereas uh, in uh, Baptist churches, you have, uh, Reformed Baptist churches, you have multiple elders within a local congregation, but there is no presbytery sitting above those local congregations. Um, so uh, I agree that uh, there's certainly a development uh, that happens here, um, but I'll get into that in the end, why I think uh, our position is biblical and uh, is proper in how we have uh, developed our theology of the ministry. So uh, claims of apostolic authority then must be abandoned, and I agree. There are no living apostles today, and there are no men who have the right and privileges of the apostles in the form of bishops, because none of these men have seen the risen Christ physically, bodily, from the dead, the way that the apostles did. However, Hansen makes a very interesting point. Even if you don't have individual official ministers who have, quote, apostolic authority, it does not mean that apostolic ministry has ceased to exist within the church. Just that it has... Uh, ceased, or just that it is not uh, in the sense that is given uh, above by Hansen. Um, the body which possessed authority in the beginning was the whole church. Once again, we are the holy priesthood, the royal nation, and elect people, quoting from 1 Peter 2. The primitive Christian community had organic authority that was not divorced from the rest of the church. That is, no ministry or hierarchy who have received their commission directly from Christ or his apostles or their successors independently existed apart from the rest of the church. If an, quote, official ministry, end quote, consisting of permanent officers occupying offices to which they succeed and to which they are appointed by formal ordinationists to develop, it must be regarded as developing from the primitive church which originally did not possess such a form of ministry. So the next subsection, the official ministry. The official ministry did develop, though, and by the end of the second century, century the monarchical episcopate was the universal norm. We notice from Ignatius that he does not mention the bishop in Rome at the beginning of the second century because there was not yet a single monarchical episcopate or bishop in Rome. Rome seemed to still be ruled by a council of elders. So a question he asks, was this a disaster, a hardening of the arteries of the nascent church, a stereotyping of its doctrine, a stifling of its life in legalism and moralism and in institutions? Answer, a resounding no. The church developed an official ministry because it needed the official ministry. You had internal conflicts with heresies, and you had external pressure from the pagan world. The church had to come to a, quote, reconciliation with time, end quote. The eschaton, that is the last day, wasn't going to come right away, so the church needed to prepare itself for living history. This is Hansen's argument. Once again, he's arguing from that point of uh, liter liberalism um, that uh, is stating that, well, the early church thought that... Um, it, uh, the last days were upon them, and in a sense, they were upon them. You still have the destruction of Jerusalem um, that happened. and uh, But I think what he is saying is true, that the coming of Christ in the kingdom, they recognized after the death of the apostles that, well, maybe there's going to be a long period of history in which the church is growing and spreading throughout the earth. And so... Uh, I agree with Hansen that there was a development in Christian ministry. I just deny that there was no such Christian ministry at the beginning, um, but we'll continue. So Hansen says, um, you know, there was no loss of innocence or of power, you know, and that the development of the Christian ministry was not incompatible with the gospel. 
In the baptismal creed, canon of the New Testament, the rule of faith, and a more ordered discipline of the church, we can recognize proper development. That is, is the Nicene Creed simply because it wasn't there in the New Testament? Can we say that, oh, this is bad, we should never say the Nicene Creed? Like, no. The Nicene Creed was you know, written as a response to a theological controversy to define what the Bible did teach. Um, as well, the development of the Christian ministry uh, was something that the church needed. Um, you needed to have organization uh, going forward. Um, and uh, just because you have an elevation of a bishop over the rest of the presbyters doesn't necessarily mean that this was bad or wrong. And uh, Hansen makes very interesting a very interesting point. Um, we can't return unreflectingly, unconsciously to a period of spontaneity and improvisation. Experience can't be unlearnt or undone. So, in other words, we can't have an artificial primitiveness the way that, say, like the emergent church, uh, you know, was it Brian McLaren and you know, sort of neo, uh, I would call them the neoliberals, um, you know, where you have, you know, the mood lighting and the lamps and, you know, the guitar and the v-neck, and it's like, well, you know, let's just all, you know, uh, you know, have this kumbaya um, and uh, you know, not really have, you know, the pastor is no longer in the necktie. You know, he's in, you know, the, the unbuttoned, you know, shirt with the tank top on underneath. And he has the jeans and, you know, the, the square glasses. And so he's trying to come down to the people. Um, and, uh, you know, you see this impulse as well. There's a book uh, by George Barna and I forget the other writer called uh, Pagan Christianity. You see this in the open theist Greg Boyd, who's a friend of theirs, talking about all of these developments of you know Christian tradition that were influenced by paganism, and therefore, you know, we need to go back to you know having you know just uh, no leadership within the early church or no formal leadership within the early church. Everybody just participates together, you know, and there's no structure or hierarchy. Um, Hansen is resisting this. He's saying, no, <laughs> that's going to lead to disaster and anarchy, which is exactly what it has led to in much of evangelicalism. So Hansen continues, an official ministry is part of tradition and is inescapable. But, as in the case of other traditions, it must be compared with and judged by the Bible. This is the doctrine of sola scriptura, that as influenced by higher criticism as Hansen is, he still seems to hold to some form of sola scriptura. He quotes, or I quote, uh, the dream of a holy formless, holy charismatic, holy spontaneous church in the 20th, 20th century is a fantasy. The official ministry of the church is a permanent feature of its life. What we should ask uh, concerning it is not should it be there, but what should it mean? How should it function? What is its relationship to the church as a whole? These are far more mature questions than so many people ask today. I'm very grateful that uh, uh, Bishop Hansen put this uh, in this book. Uh, he talks about sacerdotal priesthood next. He says, an official Christian ministry was a novelty that had no connection to the Jewish priesthood nor the rabbinate. It contained no theological significance. And I think what he's meaning by that is no sacerdotal significance. You know, the elders and the episcopos, you know, the, the bishop of the early church, when they first came around, um, or when you see this in the New Testament, they're not functioning in the way that rabbis uh, or priests in the Jewish religion would have functioned. And they're not derived from those institutions. They are wholly separate from those institutions, which is important. Um, the, the Christian ministry is not a continuation organically with uh, the system of ministry that you see within Second Temple Judaism. Um, what we see in ministry in the New Testament is something that is divine that comes out of the church. Um, 
you know, we don't, the pastor is not just, you know, the next, you know, iteration uh, of the rabbi. That's, that's not what the pastor or the elder or the, the bishop is. Uh, and so Hansen mentions within this ministry, so this Christian ministry that had developed, this official ministry, you have the development of the concept of this ministry being a priesthood. Priesthood, when it entered into Christian tradition, was a development, but a development of doctrine, of interpretation, rather than the development of a new institution. That is, we had presbyters, we had bishops, but they weren't originally called priests. They only later came to be called priests. So you have a transformation in a new direction of an existing institution. So question. This is what Hansen asked. Was the development of the sacerdotal understanding of the official ministry a right and proper development the way the development of the official ministry itself was? And here's an answer. One immediate answer can confidently be given. What has been called, quote, the sacerdotal priesthood, end quote, certainly was not a right and proper development. Sacerdotal, defined as the priest by, uh, that is, the priest is defined by his cultic activity, offering to God the sacrifice of Christ in the Eucharistic, Eucharistic rite, in which he alone has the meanings of grace, to the sacraments and exclusive control over them. This is not a proper development. And there's a story he tells of an insane priest who once said the words of institution in a confectioner's shop in Paris and turned the whole shop full of bread into the body of Christ. And therefore the Archbishop of Paris, Paris bought up and destroyed the entire contents of the shop. Uh, this is the kind of... Uh, improper development that you see of this concept of the priesthood. So Hansen states that the concept of priesthood was deliberately connected to the Old Testament Levitical priesthood as a continuity, continuation of the sacrificing priesthood. The priest had control to salvation, uh, access to salvation. They offered sacrifices for the living and the dead. Those who depart this life can hardly achieve eternal life without priestly assistance and that this sacerdotal caste governs the church. This concept of priesthood, Hansen states, is not only unhistorical, but highly undesirable. Amen. No priesthood was founded by Christ or his apostles. Amen. No command was given to a sacerdotal caste to govern the church by some higher commission divorced from the authority of the rest of the church. Amen. And here's where I will read from page 97 to the end of 99. The original officials upon whom the title of priest was conferred were bishops, not presbyters, and presbyters were thought to derive their priesthood from the bishop, reversing the relationship ascribed to them in later thought. The concept is not merely not to be found in the scriptures, where the word for a priest as an official minister in the Christian church simply does not occur. It is actually unscriptural, anti-scriptural. Not only the epistle to the Hebrews, but also the whole thought of Paul and many other passages in the New Testament too make it quite clear that with Christ, all sacrifice and cultic priesthood, whether Jewish or pagan, has become insignificant and emptied of purpose. Further, the confining of the means of grace to the priesthood is a flat contradiction to that liberty which the New Testament claims that Christ has brought to all who will accept it. All Christians are equally entitled to approach God in Christ freely and joyfully in faith and love. The precious gift which Christ has brought, new being, state of justification, eschatological joy, entry into the kingdom of heaven, is the right and heritage of all. It is manifestly wrong for clergy or priest or any other official to claim, to teach, or to even boast that they and they alone can dispense this gift because they alone admit people to sacraments. In sacraments, God offers himself to man, but man does not control him. Such an idea infringes the majesty, the transcendence, the freedom of God, as well as restricting the freedom of Christians. Again, the sacerdotal concept of priesthood appears to obscure completely, if not actually abolish, the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers. It drains believers' priesthood, or the better, or better, the priesthood of all baptized people, and I agree with that, uh, all away into the priesthood of the clergy, 
It contributes to that tendency to create of the clergy a ruling caste, controlling cult and sacraments, and sharpens the distinction between clergy and laity to the point where the clergy, for most purposes, are the church, and the laity at best become a dumb and docile flock, acted upon rather than acting, and at worst, amateur voluntary Christians in contrast to the clergy who are paid professional Christians. The more specifically Eucharistic aspects of this sacerdotal concept of priesthood draw those who discuss them into very controversial areas of debate. Perhaps it is enough to say that the idea that priests or anybody else offer Christ as a sacrifice is highly debatable and is not easy to reconcile with Paul's doctrine of justification by faith, and that the converting power of the priest's activity upon the bread and wine in the Eucharist is also a most ambiguous doctrine which needs to be explored with care and can only be accepted with many qualifications. And yet this last doctrine is in some ways the foundation stone of the sacerdotal concept of the priesthood. And this is something that my opponent uh, brought up in our debate that um, I can go into uh, in further detail at a, diff at a later time. And uh, I'll finish with this last paragraph from Hansen on this section. The great basic incurable fault of this doctrine is, in my view, that it defines the priesthood in terms of the Eucharistic cult. It makes the early Christian bishops and presbyters into sacrificing cultic priests and subordinates all other aspects of their ministry to that. This was a serious and unjustified innovation made in the Western Church in the 3rd and in the Eastern Church in the 4th centuries. It had important and far-reaching consequences for the ministry, for the Church, and for many aspects of Christian doctrine, almost all of which were disastrous and led ultimately more than any other purely theological contribution to the breakup of the Western Church in the 16th century. If Christians in the 20th century are to achieve a better understanding of scripture and of tradition and of Christianity as a whole, this sacerdotal concept of priesthood must either be discarded altogether or drastically modified. Amen. The next subsection is true priesthood. Here, Hansen argues that the concept of priesthood should not be discarded as many reformed have. Once again, this is Hansen's argument. The Anglican Communion has priests, but they are not defined in cultic terms. He says most religions have had men or women called priests who have in some sense stand for God. The priest, uh, he said, identifies himself with his people, struggles for them, prays for them, thanks for them, uh, plans for them, understands their problems and feelings and fears and hopes. Uh, he says... Uh, there's another problem, uh, the opposite issue of ministers too closely identifying themselves with their people. They become welfare officers, politicians, socialites, or at worst, entertainers. How much of that describes contemporary American Christianity? Um, whether you look at the prosperity movement, uh, guys like Joel Osteen, Benny Hinn, uh, Creflo Dollar, ugh. The worst of the worst are men like Jesse Duplantis or Kenneth Copeland. Um, or, on the other hand, you have entertainers uh, who are crass and blasphemous like Stephen Furtick. Um, that, uh, you know, you have so many problems when you have a loss of respect and reverence for the man of God uh, in the pulpit. And so I totally understand that Hansen means that. Hansen, though, it's interesting, he still uses the term alter Christus, which is another Christ, but he divorces it from its cultic association with the Eucharistic sacrifice. Uh, I'm not sure I would hold on to the term alter Christus uh, because of the historical baggage that comes with it, but I can see what he means. Um, and so then he comes to, after defining what he sees as true priesthood, uh, which is a man who identifies himself with his congregation, who's praying for them, who's interceding, uh, to God before them, um, not mediating, but interceding. Um, the distinction there being that the mediator is on the level of both parties, whereas the intercessor is not on the level of the higher party, uh, but is on the level of the lower party, interceding. Um, we do have intercessory prayer, and that is an important part of the ministry. Um, so then he goes in and talks uh, the next subsection, the corollaries of the true priesthood. He says, it is the bishop who is the priest par excellence, not the presbyter. He was the central minister of the church. The Middle Ages distracted the bishop with roles not connected with ministry. 
And once again, he mentions they became lawyers, civil servants, judges, financiers, barons, governors, statesmen, and soldiers. This loss of focus was at the heart of the Reformation critique of the Episcopate. And you saw barely any semblance left of a pastor and the medieval bishop. Hansen then criticizes the Anglo-Catholics. So this is the Oxford movement. This is your uh, Tractarians, your John Henry Cardinal Newmans, who emphasize sacerdotalism and claim apostolic succession even within the Anglican communion. He says, there's nothing in the Anglican ordinal about sacrifices for the living and the dead, and understanding the priesthood in cultic terms narrows the office, and it loses rather than gains from understanding the office in these cultic terms. He then criticizes the sacerdotalism uh, of the sacraments, especially holy orders, and the, Roman, the Romish doctrine of the character indelibus, the idea that the priest always has this indelible mark that is left upon him by holy, or, uh, by holy orders. Once again, this is a Catholic doctrine. I don't think it applies to the Eastern churches, um, at least in the way that it does within uh, Rome. So he says, if we deny the character in Delibus, then we also deny the potestas of the priest to convert the elements of the bread and wine into the body and the blood. He says, it seems to me undesirable to view this priesthood thus in cultic terms. Um, he then talks about the doctrine of priestly power derived from Eucharistic theology and not vice versa. That is, that the understanding of the priesthood in cultic terms actually developed from Eucharistic theology and not vice versa. That is, that when the church began to review the Eucharist as a sacrifice, that's when you begin to see the priest viewed, uh, or the bishop and the presbyter viewed in priestly terms. So he says, uh, the church is an organic whole and priests represent the whole congregation. They are not acting under any individual mandate or authority. And he says, uh, the emergence of the official ministry concentrated authority, so the power to excommunicate or to communicate, the power to retain or forgive sins. But here, but, uh, uh, here the priest or the bishop still always represents the whole church that it must never be forgotten that the minister represents the whole church. He says, uh, Hansen says, it is to the church, not to the ministry apart from and independent from the rest of the church that Christ has given the power of the keys. And that's what we see in Matthew chapter 18. Peter receives the keys in Matthew chapter 18 along with the rest of the disciples. And now we're going to finish up with a couple of comments about uh, Hansen. He talks about women as priests and then the excommunical priesthood. And then I'm going to finish off with uh, my analysis of the book. So uh, the subsection entitled Women as Priests, he asks a question, can women be ordained priests and should women be ordained priests? Hansen answers, he goes back to the idea that Christ and the apostles did not ordain anyone in the modern sense. Once again, this is where his higher criticism comes in. He says, none of the 12 were women, but Christ had women followers, and it was women who first saw the risen Lord. Yes, and that was a radical thing uh, in those days, that the testimony of a woman would be accepted. And if anything, that adds to the strength, because of how countercultural it was, to the veracity of the resurrection accounts. Nobody would have believed women by themselves back in the day, and so it's very important that we have that testimony of the women being the first to see the risen Christ. Um, and so, yes, Scripture is highly, highly um, uh, uh, salutatory and, uh, you know, praise, uh, uh, you know, women are praised within Scripture. They are not seen as inferior to men in any sense of, uh, their essence or their being. Uh, women are sisters in Christ, those who are believers. Um, they have an equal um, share in the kingdom of heaven. Um, and the Bible is in no way, contra contrary to feminists, uh, an anti-woman book. If anything, the Bible, especially in the cultural context in which it exists, has a high and exalted view of women, uh, in an appropriate sense. Um, 
However, this is where we're going to have to make some differences with Hansen. He says, he calls the gospel accounts contradictory. Once again, here's his higher criticism coming out. He says, of the witness of Paul, once again, the pastorals are cast out in Hansen's view. He denies that Paul ordained anyone. And in 1 Corinthians 14, 34-35, he says, women are to be silent in the church. Hansen calls this verse... Uh, and I think this is fatal to Hansen's position. Um, uh, he had himself acknowledges it. Can women be priests? This is the question Hansen asks. And so he turns to Paul's witness in 1 Corinthians 14, 34-35. Once again, he's cast out the pastoral, so he's not even going to interact with the pastorals here. Uh, Paul says, women are to be silent in the church. And uh, Hansen says, this could be fatal to his position, um, as if this is an eternal command. But then Hansen is going to run away from the text here. He attacks Tertullian's commentary uh, on women being silent in the church's unloving legalism. He says Paul was simply speaking like a Jew of 20 centuries ago, which, once again, this is the exact kind of language that liberals are going to use. Uh, he, here's some quotes from Hansen. He says, Paul was a, a Jew from 20 centuries ago, living in a society made for men run by men, where women were regarded as naturally inferior and subordinate. Hansen then attacks uh, chapter 11, verse 2 through 16 of 1 Corinthians, talking about head coverings, saying, Paul's arguments are obscure and fantastic. Therefore, Hansen draws, to me, inappropriately, a connection between chapter 11 and chapter 14 in 1 Corinthians, uh, saying that uh, the command in chapter 14 cannot be an eternal command. He then goes to Colossians 3, 11, talking about, you know, there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. Um, and then he says the same logic could be used against female politicians and professionals. Well, if a woman is to keep silent in church, then she shouldn't be able to be a president. Well, I would argue against Mr. Hansen that perhaps uh, he needs to read the prophets who describe being ruled over by women and children as a judgment upon a nation. Uh, and then he goes into a, a little bit of a rage here where he says, the limitation of priesthood to men is, quote, ungenerous, ignoble, narrow, selfish, bigoted, timid, and my favorite word that he uses at the end, conservative <laughs> well uh, as much as i have respect for hansen this is his goofy anglicanism coming out uh in the final subsection he mentions the ecumenical priesthood he said christian disunity remains a grave scandal and a serious hindrance to the true life of christ church amen i think this is a a, a big problem within christianity uh, and within Christendom is the fact that we don't have a united church. Um, but once again, um, I will quote from Gavin Ortland's channel on YouTube that truth should be what unites, and that all disunity within the church, both within a local congregation and between congregations, is due to sin. And Christians are still sinners uh, in the temporal sense, even though positionally we are no longer sinners and uh, we are not described as such by the Bible um, or by the New Testament uh, in a positional sense. But uh, we still are imperfect until we reach glory and uh, we should find better ways to foster unity. But what kind of unity is Hansen talking about? He describes that some Roman Catholics are dis dissatisfied with sacerdotalism. And he also says that free churches, so that would be like your Baptists and your non-denoms and your Presbyterians, they have a more priestly ministry than they realize. I agree. And so Hansen finishes off by stating his th true thesis. And of course, being an Anglican, he is going to advocate for the Anglican uh, model. He says the model of priesthood uh, that uh, is best offered is offered in the Anglican model. He says in it the best aspects of both the Reformed and the Catholic traditions are reconciled. And to me once again this smacks of the quote via media. Hansen sees the reconciliation of the Christian world to be God's unique destiny for the Anglican communion. 
a very interesting way to end an otherwise fascinating and helpful book. Um, I wish that were true. Maybe that could have been said of Anglicanism a hundred years ago, um, in which you had the tradition of the high church um, along with the evangelical and reformed doctrines of the faith being sort of conjoined, but um, I will offer my analysis now uh, in light of that ending. Uh, overall, I highly recommend this book for anybody who is interested in learning more about the uh, development of the priesthood in church history and about the New Testament evidence. Um, I'll give uh, three strengths of Hansen's thesis and then three weaknesses. And then I will offer some scripture passages um, for your edification. So three strengths. Uh, number one, I think Hansen, his scholarship is outstanding, at least in terms of laying out a lot of the facts. Um, as Schaff mentions, as bad as higher criticism was for the church, one of the things that it did is that it cut through the old bigotries uh, that existed across denominational and confessional lines. Um, it tried to take a fresh and unbiased uh, look at uh, the traditions that are in the church um, and uh, to try and find some reconciled position that all Christian communions could come to. Um, and I think Hansen does a great job of just laying out, um, you know, discussions of Tertullian, Hippolytus, Cyprian, uh, Clement of Rome, the Didache, uh, John Chrysostom, um, as well as talking about uh, the developments in the priesthood in the Middle Ages and at the time of the Reformation. Um, that leads to point two. Uh, the second strength is that the first three chapters really are a thorough uh, even if um, uh, they, they are a, uh, they are a balanced and circumspect um, exposition of the development of the doctrine of the priesthood, even if it's not an exhaustive exposition. And uh, thirdly, uh, a strength, I, I appreciate his conciliatory tone. Um, he is not assigning blame to any particular individual for improper developments. Um, he's trying to get people to be humble, um, as well as to call them to communion, um, not in the sense that Rome would call somebody to communion or the Eastern, various Eastern churches would call people to communion saying, you have to be part of our communion in order to be in Christ. Otherwise you are damned. Um, you know, I agree with extra ecclesium nulla solace, but what is the church? Is the church its priesthood? Is it its hierarchy? Or is the church God's people? The fullness of the elect? I think that's a question we all have to, to wrestle with and we have to answer. And that leads me to the three weaknesses in Hansen's uh, thesis. And it all comes down to all three of these are related to his presupposition of higher criticism that he laid out at the beginning. Uh, one, he jettisons the evidence of the pastorals. He completely discounts the pastorals as being written from Paul. I think this is fatal to his thesis of the fact that there was no official ministry or no ministry as such founded by the apostles. I agree. I don't think Christ set up elders and overseers within the church, but I believe the apostles did. Number two, women's ordination. Once again, his exegesis of 1 Corinthians 14, 34-35, as well as uh, 11, 2-16, and Colossians 3, uh, 11. Are... He knows what the answer is. <laughs> But he lets his higher criticism once again color his response. And you can almost see this like rage as he writes about the ungenerous, ignoble, narrow, selfish, bigoted, timid, and conservative limitation of Christian ministry to men. Um, once again, I think that's colored by his higher criticism. And three, because of his higher criticism, I believe that although Hansen has a significantly higher view of the Bible than liberals today, 
he still has a low view of scripture uh, in comparison with what Christ and the apostles and the early church uh, and the reformers, um, you know, Christians in the Middle Ages, uh, his view of the Bible uh, to me is too low. And once again, all of the weaknesses in the book to me are directly related to Hansen's uh, presupposition of higher criticism. So what is my opinion? What do I think of his thesis? I wholly 100% agree with Hansen's thesis that not only is the sacerdotal priesthood, uh, based off of what I've read and learned in scripture and seen uh, in my readings of the early church, um, it is a theological novum that is a development in history and it is an unhelpful and, to me, a very dangerous development, even if it was an originally an unintentionally dangerous development. Um, I think Hebrews is clear. There's only one Christian priest in the ultimate sense of, you know, the, the, uh, of the idea of a, we only have one sacerdotal priest. We only have one priest who offers a sacrifice for sins, and that's Christ himself. The writer of Hebrews is clear, and there's no need for any other sacerdotal priest than Christ himself. Christ is not offering himself today. Um, we're not entering into his uh, sacrifice as if we are representing Christ's sacrifice again in the way that Rome would say, um, or that this is somehow an eternal sacrifice that can just be accessed at any point. No. Christ's sacrifice is done, and that's a good thing. It's finished. It's over. And that is a joyous truth. Christ is not on the cross today. He is alive in heaven at the right hand of the Father, ever interceding for his people, as the writer of Hebrews says, who I believe to be Paul, uh, in Hebrews 7.25. Um, and that is a glorious truth. Um, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are being, present tense, sanctified, where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer an offering for sin. It's good that there's no longer an offering for sin in the Christian church because that offering has already occurred, and it's in the past. What we are asked of as Christians is to believe, to believe in that offering, that he truly, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures that he is alive today at the right hand of the Father, and that one day he will come again, and of his kingdom there will be no end. That's the basics of the Apostles' Creed, of the Nicene Creed, um, and that we are saved by believing in him and in that message, which is the gospel. What do I think about his view of the fact that there are no official ministers? I'll read the New Testament evidences. This is the farewell to Ephesus that Paul makes in chapter 20 of Acts of the Apostles, starting in verse 17. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time. Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks in repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold by the Spirit, or bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course in ministry, which I received from the Lord Jesus. Note that Paul received his ministry directly from Jesus. To testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God, 
Now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. I cannot imagine the sadness that must have been palpable in that moment. These men, these elders who Paul had raised up in Ephesus to shepherd the church, to be men who would preach the gospel, who would proclaim the message of truth about the grace of God, the forgiveness of sins, salvation in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. The sadness that they must have felt knowing that Paul was going to leave them and he was never coming back in this life. The man who I'm sure many of them either had been led directly to the faith, had been led to the faith directly by, or had been discipled by him directly, that uh, I can only imagine um, if the pastors that I have been under, um, if things get as bad in the United States as they could get, um, if he was being led off to prison um, for serving the Lord faithfully um, because the state has deemed uh, the gospel to be a crime against the state, um, how difficult that would be to see the men who have preached the word to me, who have exhorted me to holiness, um, and who remind me of Christ every day, um, to see them being led off in chains, um, or knowing that they were going to be led off in chains, uh, to stand before a magistrate of the state for the crime of proclaiming the gospel. Um, I cannot imagine how difficult that would be. And that's essentially what's happening here. Paul is getting ready to go to Jerusalem where he knows he's going to be arrested and then sent off to Rome to stand before Caesar, the emperor himself, to testify of the gospel. To give the gospel to the most powerful man in the world at that time and to call him to repentance and faith. It's, it's beyond words. So continuing on in verse 25, he says, And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you bishops to pastor the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. So here we see the threefold nature uh, the threefold nature and dignity of Christian ministry. In verse 17 they are called elders. This is the respect and the dignity that they command for their maturity in the faith. In verse 28, they are called bishops or overseers. This is the office that they hold. This is the, the position that they have within the church to oversee the church. And then what is their function? What is their role? To pastor the church of God. And so we see the elder, bishop, and pastor are one and the same in the New Testament. They are elders by dignity, overseers by office, and pastors in role. And I love the way he ends it. The church of God, which he, that is God, purchased with his own blood. Well, according to Paul, 
who who could be God that has purchased the church with his own blood? It's Christ. In the very passage that the Apostle Paul describes to us the, the role of the elder, the role of the bishop to pastor the church, why? Why is this role so important? Because they're meant to pastor the church, which God purchased with his own blood. This is Christ's church. It's no bishop's church. It's no priest's church. It's no rich and powerful layman's church who's trying to pull the strings behind the scenes. It's Christ's church that the elders have been charged with. There's no pope, no patriarch, no king. It's Christ's church that he bought with his own blood. So this is a statement of Jesus' deity that the eternal God himself came down for us and for our salvation and died on a cross for our sins. And that from that sacrifice he has purchased for himself an elect people. And what is interesting, while I think there is reference here to the Catholicity of the church, the church universal, all of the elect from all the ages, what church is he talking about in the immediate context? The local church. The church there in Ephesus that is the instantiation of the universal church in local form that these men are going to be tasked with shepherding. The old men, the young babies, the nursing mothers, the young men in their strength, the little old ladies who would have been orphans, Jews, Gentiles, barbarians, all of them, the entire congregation. This is whom they are responsible for. And so Paul finishes off. He says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, to me there's at least some distinction in the eldership. Men will arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert. Remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. Notice he doesn't commend them to tradition. He doesn't condemn, commend them to a pope or to Peter's successor. What does he commend them to? To God and to the word. Which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner you must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. When he said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all, and they began to weep aloud and embraced Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And what kind of character were these men to have? First Timothy 3. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. 
not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? Once again, this is a direct strike at clerical celibacy in any form. If a man chooses that he would better be off, better off not marrying and that he has a gifting from God to not burn with passion in that way, then so be it. But the norm that we see prescribed in Scripture, not merely described, but prescribed, is that it's a husband of one wife and a man who can manage his own household. That is why the norm in the church should be bishops. If you're going to have an Episcopal form of church government, bishops should be married. They should know how to run their own household. And if they can't, if they have a child who's an apostate and who is one who is blaspheming the faith, then that bishop should step down. And I would say the same for any elder if you're going to have a Presbyterian model of church government, whether in a Presbyterian form with a presbytery of the local church or a presbyterate or Presbyterian form of church government as Baptists do within a local church of having multiple congregation or multiple elders in a single congregation but the norm is those men should be married for this reason so continue on in verse 6 and not a new convert so that he will not become conceited and fall into condemnation incurred by the devil and he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil and then he goes in and discusses deacons as well uh, after that. Titus chapter 1. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you, not a single bishop, elders. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not, accursed, uh, not accused of, dissipa of dissipation or rebellion, for the overseer, and now he interchangeably uses these terms, for he says that there's to be multiple elders, and then he describes with that individual elder whom he calls the overseer or the bishop, he describes what that man must be like. For he must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain. Notice the parallels between First Timothy and Titus chapter 1 but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. So, to some... Uh, this nearly three-hour video now. Um, I highly recommend The Christian Priest Examined by Bishop Richard Hansen. Um, there's a lot of good in here. Um, I think that uh, he does a great job with his scholarship, but that he is colored by higher criticism. And uh, as far as where I come down, um, I agree the sacerdotal priesthood is an improper development in the church. But unlike Hansen, because I accept the pastorals as being written by Paul and being every bit as much of the Word of God as the rest of Scripture, that uh, there is an office that has been set up within the church. It's the office of elder, and there's a secondary office, the office of deacon. Um, and that uh, God gives specific qualifications, and that uh, in order to have a biblical New Testament church, uh, its leadership must look as the leadership that is laid out by the apostles themselves uh, in Holy Scripture. So thank you all. Um, thank you for bearing with me. Um, I hope this was helpful, and be on the lookout for new material as it comes. Thank you, and uh, uh, grace and peace be with you all from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.